Averagely good statisticians, particularly if they're confident, are actively damaging and dangerous. If you fundamentally get it wrong, this is a case where you, you can be not just a bit wrong, you can be unbelievably orders of magnitude wrong about the assumptions you make. Hey friends, and welcome back to Deep Dive, the weekly podcast where every week it's my immense privilege to sit down with academics and authors and creators and entrepreneurs and other inspiring people, and we find out how they got to where they are and the strategies and tools we can learn from them to help us build a life that we love. Rory is the vice chairman of Ogilvy UK, which is one of the biggest marketing and advertising companies in the world. He's the author of the book, Alchemy, the surprising power of ideas that don't make sense. And he's got some absolutely sick TED Talks that have been viewed over 7 million times. There will be so much suspicion that we've got chat GPT to write our thank you letters, that the only way to overcome this is to actually fill our thank you letters with profanities. So thanks very much for the fucking dinner party. It was totally boss. Viva il duce. All our personal correspondence will have to become kind of, you know, absolutely profane in order for it to seem sincere. We talk about the psychological value of products and how to create value from thin air and the power of surprising ideas in the world of marketing and advertising. If you can imagine a stand-up comedian doing a routine about your product, then you're onto something. The urge to appear serious is in many ways, I think, a disaster in marketing. And Rory's just an incredibly interesting and inspirational person with so much life experience and so many stories. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. At the moment, according to the YouTube analytics, 81% of you who are watching this on YouTube have not yet hit the subscribe button. And so if you're, for example, in the now 81% of people who are watching this on YouTube, but who are not subscribed to the channel, I would love it if you could do so. And it would be awesome to get that number down to 50%. And it would be cool to get like 50-50 sub non-sub ratio, just, just for fun. Rory, so you studied classics at Christ College, uh, yep. if, if your Wikipedia page is to be believed. Um, I was just down the road at Emmanuel, and I wonder why classics, and what did you learn doing classics? Because it seems, seems a bit rogue to go from classics to advertising. Uh, well, it, it was a bit more rogue than that, because mm. I made the short-term mistake and uh, long-term success, I think, by choosing as A-levels um, uh, maths, further maths, Latin and Greek. <laughs> And it was a total mistake at the time because the people doing physics, chemistry, maths were effectively, um, you know, doing interconnectedly the same thing. Whereas I had to have this slightly schizoid thing where you had to go from sort of translating Homer to doing, uh, you know, some advanced statistical modeling or something. And it was difficult. And at the time, I think it was a mistake. Um, in the longer term, I think it was a great decision because one of the things is you only have to have fairly good statistical understanding um, for it to be a superpower in the workplace. So I st bizarrely, my brother's an astrophysicist. I'm still uh, very interested in science, particularly, uh, you know, the, the, the both the potential and the ills of quantification. Um, big book recommendation to start with, Algorithms to Live By and the Alignment Problem, both mm. by Brian Christian. I really highly recommend. So I, I read a lot of science. I read an awful lot of evolutionary biology as well um, because it's a new way to think. Um, so, but the classic side was, to be honest, what classics is, okay, is it's modern languages for nerds, okay? <laughs> okay. So, so it, there's quite a high correlation between people who are fascinated by class classics and people who are fascinated by, say, sci-fi, because it is, if you like, an alternate civilization. Um, and also, the fact that you don't actually have to speak to it because everybody involved is dead probably appeals to people who are slightly on the spectrum. So if you're one of those people who are undecided between science and the arts, um, classics is actually bizarrely a kind of weird kind of compromise. What were you doing at Emmanuel? Uh, I studied medicine. You did medicine? Oh, <laughs> yeah. So <fantastic. laughs> kind of six years of medicine, two years of working, and then switched into this kind of YouTuber podcaster career. Now, what's thing. interesting is that they limit the number of people who can study medicine in the UK, and I think that's the BMA, which pretends to be a scientific organisation, but is really a trade union for doctors. If I'm, oh yeah, I yeah. mean they're going to be striking in the next few weeks. Yeah, <laughs> <But>. <laughs> uh, exactly. Now, interestingly, there seems to be a premise. Then I, I accept the fact that it's very expensive getting a medical qualification because you actually need corpses and stuff, which you don't need for classics by and large. Um, but. There seems to be an axiomatic assumption there that you only need to train in medicine that number of people you need to be doctors. Now, it strikes me that that's a fundamental 
fundamentally wrong-headed idea that actually having surplus people with medical qualifications would actually be, despite the cost of training, would actually be valuable. It might be valuable to the pharmaceutical industry. It might be valuable to overseas, for example. But actually having a surplus of trained doctors uh, would actually be valuable in all kinds of unanticipated knock-on ways. Just as actually, you know, you don't have to. And obviously, I didn't become a classics teacher. I nearly did, but I didn't in the end. Um, what happened, I actually trained as a teacher after I finished, and then I had a kind of panic attack because I realised if I went straight into teaching, my entire life would be school, university, school. And I thought spending your entire life in educational establishments was just a bit too limiting. Mm. And then I started applying to ad agencies. And whereas the conversation in the staff room was kind of Noggis Minor has been smoking behind the bike sheds, the conversation in the ad agency was, I think I was waiting for my interview at Ogilvy and someone came in and said, no, it wasn't that great because I had to change planes in Addis Ababa or something. <laughs> I remember thinking, this, you don't get that in the staff room. This sounds a bit interesting. And, you know, it was the late 80s and we were all materialistic as hell. And advertising did have that kind of Venn diagram overlap between pretty interesting reasonably lucrative okay um but 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 i mean it, it is interesting how there is a kind of shallow logic which often pervades decisions you know the assumption that you only train as doctors that number of people you need as doctors uh, strikes me as a fundamental mistake there's an opportunity cost there that we're probably not noticing yeah, and I think in the medicine path, there's also so the, the, there's also like weird weird bottlenecks in the system. So, for example, last year there were more people graduating medical school in the UK than there were foundation year junior doctor jobs available. Right. But then, as you go further down the path, there are a lot of specialties that are, or most specialties are also oversubscribed in that applying for specialty training is competitive further down the line. And yet, there are still loads and loads of rotor gaps, and every single medic in every hospital would say, "Oh, like." a third of our rota, a quarter of our rota is not filled. So there's ah. some kind of supply-demand mismatch for certain for certain roles that is not being fulfilled, while at the same time the positions, especially training, are still oversubscribed. Also, having people with the confidence to speak about medicine, you know, you could have a managerial role in the NHS where someone who is medically qualified patently has some sort of credibility that, uh, you know, an average, you know, a box ticker wouldn't have. I mean, there's all, you know, there's all kind of value. The idea, I think, I think we have a very sort of weird utilitarian view of education, which mm. is that everything has to be directly to serve some particular need. I completely disagree with this. I mean, in, in, in a sense, doing maths and classics was a fantastic training for going into direct marketing because you could write. I mean, one thing about classics is it teaches you to write basically because German would be the same. The understanding of grammar means you can look at a sentence and confidently say, that's okay. Quote of Sir John Plum, I think, nothing blocks the creative mind more than fear of a solecism or something. But but the, um, the, the fact that you can confidently write a sentence and go, that's okay. Combine that with... To be honest, okay, my, if I were in charge of maths education and Rishi seems to be promoting it into the sixth form, which I don't think is a bad idea, a lot of people in the creative industries are going, oh, dear, you know. But actually, provided it's a different kind of maths, in particular um, statistical understanding, because even highly educated journalists are obviously total idiots when it comes to the interpretation of statistics. What do you mean? Kathy Newman. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, okay, her argument with Jordan Peterson, which is, you know, in other words, you know, univariate analysis of gender of, of gender differentials, which no one in the social sciences would dream of doing. Okay, I mean, you know, a lot of journalists are obviously statistically completely illiterate. If you look at something like the uh, Meadows case, what's that? Um, okay, the, it was um, uh, it was a, it was a case where a fairly eminent medic uh, posited that the chance of two cot deaths in a single household could be determined by multiplying the odds together as though there were no external factors either genetic or environmental failing to actually uh, um, accept the fact that, that both deaths were male which also increases the probability of cot death but also failing to do the elementary thing of comparing the probability of a double cot death with the probability of a double infanticide which is what you actually yeah. have to do, which changes the odds from something like overwhelmingly guilty um, with a wrong statistical model to most likely innocent 
literally only more than 50% chance of innocence once you compare the two probabilities, not effectively essentially saying, uh, well, if it, you know, if it isn't accident, it's murder. It, right, it's yeah. completely imbalanced. But, but, but people with, literally, people with Oxbridge degrees who are eminent in the medical fraternity made that mistake. Barristers, judges made that mistake. So if, if this extra maths is largely around statistics, I mean, I've never needed in my entire life to, to work out the surface area of a cone. And if I needed to do that, I think it is a third pi, it, what, what would it be? It'd be a third height times pi r squared of the radius of the base. I'm guessing. Sounds about right. Some <laughs> bullshit like that. Okay. I've never needed to do that. And if I did, I'd Google it or I'd ring up somebody who knew. Yeah. Okay. On the other hand, basic appreciation of statistics, um, I use pretty much every day to a point where it's a kind of superpower. And so just having done what you might call, you know, statistics to A-level standard and having a basic grasp of yes, but actually um, is unbelievably valuable in business or in virtually any other context. Uh, how so? Like, what, what do you mean that statistics is a superpower? Um, well, <laughs> well, it stops you being stupid um, uh, is, is one of the things. Um, it also makes you understand uh, really important concepts like the tr you know the trade off between well the explore exploit trade off is a really interesting concept which appears in AI but it also appears in things like the studies of animal foraging. Okay. So there's a trade off effectively if you're a foraging animal or for that matter you're an algorithm. Um, there's a trade off between exploration and exploitation, which is um, you know obviously you're a total idiot if you don't exploit what you already know. Okay, if you make no use of pre-existing um, knowledge. But you're equally foolish, albeit in the slightly longer term, if you don't keep exploring, but simply exploit what you know on the assumption that it will never change and your knowledge is utterly complete and incapable of uh, improvement or enhancement or, or adaptation. And so understanding a few basic mathematical concepts, I think, um, you know, I'd make algorithms to live by, uh, you know, one of the set texts for sixth form maths um, is really, really useful. I, I don't buy the um, – actually, the other thing I don't buy is I don't buy the – a few creative people in advertising got really annoyed at more people being forced to do maths because they say, I would have left school earlier, I can't stand maths. Depends on the maths, because I mean it's worth noting that um, you know solving mathematical problems by effectively rewriting the question, or you know redefining the problem, yep. okay, which is what an awful lot of advanced maths is, is actually a highly creative act, and you could actually make maths teaching actually almost a form of um, creative teaching if, yeah. if you got it right. You mentioned that you wouldn't be surprised if marketing was uh, became mostly female in the future. Why, no. why is that? Um, so partly just plotting the direction of travel, okay? Um, partly that um, uh, generally, as of now, I'm not suggesting it's innate, uh, women seem to manifest uh, a preference for working in people businesses slightly more. Not suggesting it's innate; it could be culturally inculcated, but doesn't really matter because that seems to be happening. That point, you know, I don't, don't, don't want to go all Jordan Peterson on that. <laughs> but the weird thing that when you actually make employment, uh, you know, more and more a matter of choice, weirdly, uh, in some cases, gender differences actually increase rather than reducing. Um, uh, uh, also, also, I mean, for example, I think there, there'll be a very, very substantial um, uh, Indian uh, contingent in marketing and advertising. Okay. Why? Uh, because in India, it's it's very high status. You have these extraordinary kind of universities, extraordinary high level of education around marketing, um, not only in universities, but places like Unilever, Hindustan Lever, which are kind of almost universities in themselves. And you can simply see the extraordinary talent, the extraordinary marketing talent um, that's been produced. I mean, what we have, the head of Ford North America, Indian, MasterCard, both I think the CEO and the marketing director. You know, you go, you go on and on and on. And, and um, uh, it, you know, it, it's absolutely clear cut.
that um, there's uh, and, and okay okay let's not let's not neglect the base rate okay the one point five billion people okay which kind of helps okay. yeah okay. Um, uh, but but I you know I, I I just find it interesting because. I think what often happens, if you're bad at statistics, you're not wrong to be angry about these things, but either you get angry about the wrong thing or you have the wrong idea about how to solve the problem. Okay? okay yep. Because you know, some degree of disparity will emerge from preference yep. because preference emerges from circumstance. Yep. Okay? And therefore, if different groups actually grow up in different circumstances... Uh, you would expect their preferences to differ. Hmm. And so if you don't account for that and you suggest that every single disparity is the role of either active or unconscious prejudice, I'm not saying you're wrong yep. to discuss prejudice. I'm merely saying that you're miscalibrating it. And that there are other factors going on yeah. that we need to take into account. Yeah, and it cool. worries me a bit because, you know, you know, a lot of this is kind of HR-dominated and, um, uh, you know... Uh, HR isn't necessarily the um, epicenter of sophisticated statistical understanding, if, yeah. we're, if we're to be blunt about it. And so, you know, we've got to be, we just, we just, I mean, as with um, the Sally Clark case, you know, uh, the, the cop death case. Oh, yeah. Um, getting statistics wrong is really goddamn dangerous. Um, and actually, I mean, I was watching. I'll just give you an interesting point here, which is that it's worth noting that if the data you collect is unrepresentative, then the conclusions you will draw will be similarly biased. Sure. Okay. And first of all, which is a kind of quote of mine, which gets adopted by other people, all big data comes from the same place, the past. Okay. And it's only reliable um, even if it's representative of what you truly need to know, which is a big if. It's only reliable if you can actually confidently say that the future is going to be very similar to the past, okay, which in the short term may be a safe assumption over a decade, mm -mm, not so much, okay. Um, I was talking to someone last night who had worked for um, uh, a big dairy company which delivered milk, and um, they had things down to an absolute fine art until suddenly the law changed and it was you were now allowed to buy milk from a supermarket. I mean, I, can, I, can, I think I can dimly remember when that happened, but it might have been it might have been earlier actually. It might have been the early sixties before I was born. Now you know, at that point, everything you think you know, you know, is no longer reliable as an assumption. And um, the point I'm making there is that um, if you um, if you don't actually understand the limitations of your data or the biases of your data, yep. I mean, obviously quantification bias, uh, it's much easier to get data on things which happen to be you know, numerical or measurable in terms of SI-derived units. Yep. Okay? But if, I mean, if, if you fundamentally get it wrong, this is a case where you, you can be not just a bit wrong, you can be unbelievably orders of magnitude wrong about the assumptions you make. And one of the things that worries me, okay, is let's assume that the quality of people's statistical understanding is on a bell curve, okay? Um, then, you know, with, with a, you know, a, a, a little tale of very, very good statisticians, and then, then there are people who just know nothing on the left-hand side. Don't, not too worried about them. People who don't know anything, don't possibly, let's hope, won't pretend to know anything. But what that does mean is that averagely good statisticians are going to massively outnumber really good statisticians. Okay, well, that's true in lots of fields. I'm sure that averagely good plumbers, okay, uh, massively outnumber really, really good plumbers. But averagely good plumbers are still useful. They still do a good bit of plumbing from time to time. Yeah. And assuming the job isn't like, you know, the cooling system for a nuclear power station, they're probably good enough. Okay, whereas, okay, averagely good statisticians, particularly if they're confident, are act actively damaging and dangerous. Mm. Yeah, and so that, you know, it's something we got. It's something we got to be really, really alert to because yeah. it's like if you if you overlay the bell curve onto the Dunning Kruger yes. curve, yes, exactly. you'll end up with a very large <laughs> proportion of very confident but very uh, ill-informed people about statistics. Yeah, and almost anything else. Yeah, and, and particularly if they're confident or if they're simply overly preoccupied with the neatness of the model, yep. not with how the model actually differs from reality. 
Um, Mm. Because you occasionally get this kind of pure... Now, actually, let's be fair, a lot of very good statisticians absolutely ring what they say with qualifications. But then, unfortunately, they're reporting to people who don't have the same nuanced understanding. All right, we're just going to take a quick break from the podcast to introduce our sponsor, which is Huel. Now, this is very exciting because I've actually been a paying customer of Huel since 2017. I started eating Huel in my fifth year of medical school, and I've been using Huel regularly ever since because, you know, I like to be productive. I, you know, my calendar is full with a lot of things, and often I don't have the time or don't make the time to have a particularly healthy breakfast or a particularly healthy lunch. And Huel is fantastic for those occasions because it's 400 calories. They've got tons and tons of different flavors. My favorite flavor is salted caramel because for that, you get 400 calories you also get 40 grams of protein super hard to get enough protein in my diet these days especially with, with trying to get hench and working out Huel just makes sure that i get at least those 40 grams in the 400 calories and it's got 26 different vitamins and minerals which really helps with the whole healthy balanced diet thing as well now i don't use Huel with every meal i wouldn't recommend using it with every meal but in those occasions where you find yourself reaching for a very unhealthy snack or about to order a really unhealthy takeaway it's just absolutely fantastic for being able to have the option now i use the Huel black edition in the mornings it's very nice i put two scoops of powder into my little blender type thing I add water, sometimes a bit of milk, and that gives me what I need. But also for lunch, I like using the Huel hot and savory product that they've got, which is basically you add boiling water to this container of stuff. And you can make yourself like a, they've got a really good cheese pasta type one, which is which is my favorite thing. And again, also all of these are nutritionally complete meals. They're all vegan. They all have all these nutrients and vitamins and minerals and stuff. And they're often reasonably high protein as well. And it's also ridiculously cost-effective. Like one of these meals is £1.68 for a 400 calorie meal, which is like, a tenth of the price of what I would be ordering from delivery instead. And so really, Huel is a perfect companion for a busy life where you want to get a lot of things done and you don't, if you don't necessarily have a lot of time to cook a healthy meal and deal with all the prep and all the shopping and all the cleanup, then Huel is a great addition to your life rather than a replacement for all of the meals in your life. Anyway, if that sounds up your street and you want to try out Huel, then if you head over to Huel.com forward slash deep dive, that URL is a special URL which will give you a free t-shirt and a free shaker thing with your first order. And so yeah, head over to Huel.com forward slash deep dive and thank you so much Huel for sponsoring this episode. This episode is very kindly brought to you by Trading212. Now, people ask me all the time for advice about investing because I've made a bunch of videos about it on the YouTube channel. And my advice for most people is generally invest in broad stock market index funds, which is exactly what you can do completely for free with Trading212. It's a great app that lets you trade stocks and funds and ETFs and foreign exchange if you really want to. And one of the great things about the app is that if you're new to the world of investing, you can actually invest with fake money. You don't have to put real money in. They've got a practice mode where you invest fake money and then it actually tracks what the market is doing in real time. So you can see, had I invested £100 into this thing, what would my return have been X weeks or X months further down the line? Once you've got some comfort with that, then it's super easy to deposit money into your trading 2 into account. You can use Apple Pay like I do initially, or you can use a direct bank transfer. And then once the money is in your Trading212 account, then you can invest it in basically whatever you want. Now, if you're based in the UK, you might be familiar with the concept of an ISA, which is an individual savings account, which is basically a tax-free wrapper that you can put money in. You can put £20,000 in every year, up to £20,000, and it resets every April, and then all that money can grow, and it's completely tax-free for the rest of your life. And if you want to sign up for an ISA, you can sign up for one completely for free, also on Trading212. So if you haven't yet filled up your ISA allowance, or at least put some money into your ISA for this year, that might be a good step forward. The app also lets you auto invest, which is a great thing because then you can automatically invest a percentage of your paycheck into the thing every month. And so if you haven't yet started with investing and you want to give it a go, then you can download the app on the app store. And if you use the coupon code Ali, A-L-I at the checkout, that will give you a totally free share worth up to a hundred pounds. It's available on iPhone and Android, and you can check it out by typing in trading212 into your respective app store. So thank you so much trading212 for sponsoring this episode. In one of your, I think it was one of your TED Talks or a talk that you gave, you said uh, something interesting. You said that um, a lot of, in marketing and I guess in, in life in general, there's um, a lot of stuff that gets missed because people are afraid to ask what seems like a stupid question. Mm-hmm. And so at the risk of asking what potentially is a stupid question, um, what is marketing? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, like, <laughs> Dominic Cummings sure. was regarded as being a bit of an ass, okay, by people in the civil service for continually asking why. Mm. And it was regarded as childish. It's absolutely not childish. It's actually a very, very intelligent approach because generally what happens is that intermediate objectives start dominating the um, uh, uh, dominating what you might call attention, at yep. the expense of what is the ultimate objective, okay? And so at that business of going why five times in a row, which 
apparently within Downing Street, the sort of senior civil servants regarded as, you know, practically as if you were banging knives and forks on the table going, me want din din, that's okay. Um, it's not, it's, it looks childish. It's not necessarily a high status behavior. And this is one of the most interesting things, I think. I think in complex systems, um, okay, uh, in in understanding of complex systems, in understanding of Newtonian systems, there's a kind of hierarchy of importance. There's the big stuff which has big effects, and there's the small stuff that has small effects, okay? And therefore, you know, if you pretend that the economy or that your business is a sort of Newtonian reductionist model, which I think management consultants do because they come from engineering, mm. and when they want to model anything, they tend to model it as a machine, Okay. Now, in a machine, for example, everything tends to have one function, and therefore you can define what something is for. This is what I call the Dorman fallacy. I don't know if you come across no, this. No, what is that? Okay. So the Dorman fallacy is you get a bunch of consultants into your five-star hotel, and they go, they define the Dorman's function as opening the door, which is notionally what a Dorman was for uh, in the days before automatic doors. Of course, it's a you know, it's it's really just a, you know, linguistic convenience. Dorman do many, many other things, quite a lot of them tacit, you know, recognition, security, gossiping with other doormen, you know, um, actually just maintaining the status of the hotel because if you want to charge 400 quid a night, you kind of got to have a doorman. Them as the rules, right? And what the consulting firm do is they go in, they define the doorman's role as um, uh, opening the door, and then they say, well, look, with our tech partners, who are probably paying us some sort of commission, we'll replace your doorman with an automatic opening sliding door with an infrared, you know, human recognition mechanism. And, you know, over the next five years, that's going to save you X. Mm. And everybody in the procurement and logistics function all clap and go, marvellous, we've secured this saving. And off the consultants go, okay? And then five years later, you discover the rack rates now fallen by 50% and they're vagrants asleep in the hotel entrance. Because the the doorman was doing lots of other things which weren't captured by your mod your mechanistic model of the world. Yep. Okay. And I see that happening a lot when tech replaces um it, uh, uh, generally I'm pretty happy when tech augments the options of a consumer. You know, when, you know, when when pay by smartphone app at park car parks came along i was ecstatically grateful because car parking was now typically costing six quid and having six pound coins or whatever was you know bloody painful okay <laughs> uh, so you know okay as an option yeah. as an alternative that's great yeah then what you notice is unless you've got a smartphone you can't park which effectively means that my dad who's 92 can't use a car park hmm. if we're not careful okay and so one of the things I think we've got to be really careful of is that fur line trap where something comes along as an option, you know, live chat, you know, uh, on-screen help, whatever it may be, comes along as an option. We're all unbelievably grateful for it and love it because it's an option. And then it's a bit like new Coke, classic Coke. You know, the, 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 I think this is probably, um, uh, this is probably... Um, anecdotal but one of the research mistakes they made with new coke was they didn't explain to people that this would replace old coke mm. so people go oh, i quite like this yeah okay i'm all in favor of having a new variant of coke it was only when they realized that old coke classic coke was being withdrawn that they suddenly went no no i don't like this at all mm. okay now what you know what you see i've done there is okay is I think that in complex systems, it's kind of fractal. There are recurring patterns, and the patterns recur at a small scale and at a big scale. So you can take something from the sale of chocolate bars, okay, and you can apply it to a tax system, okay? You can take an insight from, um, well, actually, okay, you can take an insight from a supermarket loyalty program, yep. okay, and you can, uh, you can give advice to the Treasury on how they should design taxation, how? how? <laughs> okay, very simple. Uh, let's take the Boots Advantage card. You get marvellous thing. By the way, I helped launch it. Oh, um, yeah, My mum is a big fan. <laughs> no, no, it's a fantastic yeah. thing. Well, there, 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 there's some fascinating things about the Boots Advantage card, one of which is in defiance of um, logic, uh, or economic logic, rather. What quite often happens is wife gets ill. Typically, more more female than males have a, an advantage card, just to explain. I'm not being sexist, okay? Wife gets ill, okay? Says to husband, ooh, I need some neurofen and some whatnot, okay? Can you go to Boots and buy me these various medical provisions? And 
just as he's leaving, okay, she says, oh, by the way, take my advantage card so you'll get the points. He goes along, picks up the Neurofen and, you know, whatever else, goes to the till, hands over the advantage card, at which point the, the, the person at the till says, actually, you can buy these all on the points you've got on the card. And he goes, ka-ching, brilliant, okay. <laughs> and goes back to wife, says, um, I uh, didn't actually pay for any of this. I got it all with your points. And she's furious, right? Now you're going to go, what? <laughs> okay, what the hell is going on there? Because it's immaterial in economic terms, whether you spend the points on Eurofen or whether you spend it on Chanel number 19. However, we prefer buying indulgences on points than with money mm. because it's less guilt-inducing, mm. okay? It's rather like, you know, it's a lot less painful going business class using your Avios points than it is using your money, <laughs> okay? Yep. Um, and even though the advantage points actually have a cash value, okay, nonetheless, there's a very clear demarcation in the mind, cookie jar accounting, Richard Thaler calls it, between what you, you know, we actually apportion different forms of money towards different ends. Okay. And therefore, if you use what's the treat budget for the staples purchases, yeah. it violates some basic sense of, of internal mental accounting. Okay. Now, the other one that's interesting is that let's imagine that instead of launching the Advantage card, Boots had simply dropped all their prices by 4% rather than giving 4% back in the shape of points, okay? Um, uh, three, years, three years later, everybody would have forgotten about it. Nobody would have noticed much at the time, actually, okay, except the really only retentive kind of, you know, value chasers, yeah. okay? And everybody would have forgotten about it six months later. Yeah. The points retain their salience. God, what is it? getting on for, I don't know, it must be 15, 20 years after that card was launched. Now, here, okay, so here's my suggestion, right? We should never, ever cut taxes. We should pay people a rebate when it's possible because a reduction in the tax rate basically loses meaning. It has a half-life of about 12 months yep. in terms of its meaning and significance. An annual tax rebate, A, a lump sum will be appreciated far more than just a, a reduction in your ex, your outgoings, yep. okay? Secondly, it will retain its salience in perpetuity. Thirdly, because it's mentally framed as a bonus, not a price cut, okay, under exceptional circumstances, e.g. someone invades a neighboring country, okay, there's a massive hike in the price of fuel, there's a problem with the tax take, for a short term, you can withdraw the rebate much more painfully, much more painlessly than you can actually increase taxes. Mm. Okay. You can say for this year only. Okay. Yeah. Whereas we tend to feel, I think, if tax rates go up, that it's a ratchet. It's going to be a long, long time before they go back down again. Yeah. So this business where you can literally take psychological insights from a loyalty program yeah. and deploy them at a, in a completely different domain. Hmm. And now what militates against it is this status idea in conversation, okay, where important people talk about big things like interest rates, you know, and the Fed, yep. okay, and you delegate small things down to junior people. Yep. Now, I have, this, I have this mantra which is dare to be trivial because I argue that in complex systems, the interesting pattern is just as likely to reveal itself at the level of chocolate bars and loyalty programs. Okay, yeah. um, I'll give you another beautiful example of, of, of this. Okay, mm -hmm. now those of you who are older and listening will remember a thing called BT Friends and Family, and that's where you nominated 10 of the people you called the most and you got 15% off those calls. Now, stand up comedians talked about friends and family, people in the pub talked about which 10 numbers, and it was a bit embarrassing because actually one of their friends and family was, you know, I don't know, a sex line or whatever it might be. Okay. <laughs> But that, that achieved a level of mental saliency. Now, it was 15% off 10 numbers. Now, admittedly, if you chose your top 10 because of the Pareto effect, that was probably like a 10% discount. People were engaged with friends and family over 10 years. If BT had simply dropped their call prices across the board by 15%, everybody would have forgotten about it mm. almost immediately. Now, here's why I say dare to be trivial, right? If you want to understand patterns that are telling, there is no telling, because it's kind of fractal, there's no telling at what scale the pattern is going to be most salient or most visible. Yep. Okay? And it is absolutely foolish 
to view the study of supermarket loyalty programs or chocolate bar promotions as being lower status than talking about Janet Yellen and the fucking Fed. Okay, and let me explain why with a very simple point. Okay, if you had gone to the Galapagos Islands in the early 19th century, you would have seen a bearded guy in an enormous hat wandering around measuring the beaks of finches. Okay. And almost anybody would have looked at this and thought, what a twat, <laughs> okay? However, it was in those telling details, you know, I mean, you can't get much more anal than, you know, Finch beak comparison, right? I yeah. mean, I would regard discussing loyalty programs as, you know, comparatively high-minded pursuit <laughs> compared to that. Sure. Okay? And yet, that's, that's where the shit reveals itself. Yep. And so I think this business of status where... Status is appropriate where big things have big effects and small things. In in the real world, because the human brain, creative people, okay, creative people are annoying to ordinary people. I, I suddenly realised my daughter has, um, one of my daughters has sort of ADHD, and it's mostly hereditary, and I suddenly realised when I looked at the diagnosis of it that I'd had it myself, and one of the things it creates is a kind of incomprehension with people who don't have it mm. because you don't have a sense of proportion in some, some respect. Okay. And then it occurred to me, in complex systems, in dealing with complex systems problems or creative problems, where there are potential butterfly effects, you're right not to have a sense of proportion because the solution is just as likely to lie in something seemingly trivial or tangential as it is in something notionally important. Okay? So actually, the sense of proportion and the status around what you might call the higher twaddle, which is its high status to talk about interest rates. And then what you end up with then is your insistence on only talking about what you might call high-end things, like the inflation rate, the interest rate, blah, 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 okay? What that does is it massively limits your creative solution space because you're left with a tiny little Overton window of a few seemingly big things that you're allowed to tweak. Mm. And I, actually, loads and loads of really interesting solutions that lie elsewhere are totally unexplored because they're beneath your dignity. Yeah. What, okay, where's the, where, where's the balance here? Because traditional business advice is, let's say you're the CEO of the company, you focus on the big picture stuff, the mission, the vision, the values, the stuff where it will, by changing the course 1%, that multiplied out over the 100 people you've got in your company means mm. that the company will change direction. Um, but then you get stories of people like Steve Jobs getting involved with like line height and letter spacing and font choice and all that <laughs> stuff, which is completely counter to what yeah, a uh, CEO uh, of a company uh, should uh, be doing. Uh, 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 in theory. <laughs> okay. What do you uh, I, okay. I, I did go and see a talk by Johnny Ive once. And I must say, there, there was more discussion of bezels than I thought was altogether healthy. <laughs> okay. But... Um, well, let me let, let me tell a story, okay, which is that in, uh, I think, practically, you know, two weeks before the launch of the iPhone, Steve Jobs had, a, 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 you know, an early prototype in his pocket with a plastic screen. And uh, he kept his keys in the same pocket, which, frankly, is stupid. Um, I, you know, I'm, uh, you know get, get a grip, Steve. You know, keys in the left pocket, phone in the right. It's not difficult. But anyway, for whatever reason, Steve <laughs> kept his keys in the same pocket as his phone, and the screen was scratched. And more or less with, you know, weeks to go, he just went, okay, can the screen, we're going for Gorilla Glass, Okay. And I think it was actually a bit unpleasant because the first delivery of Gorilla Glass turned up with Foxconn at two o'clock in the morning and all the workers were basically turfed out of their beds to start assembling iPhones, okay? Um, but nonetheless, okay, very, very few people would have done that, would have had that perfectionistic urge. And actually, you know, art, artistry, craftsmanship is to some extent about a lot of proportion. In other words, you know, God is in the details, as I think it's Mies van der Rohe, isn't it? You know, the fact that, I, I mean, service to some extent, okay, any service business to some extent achieves its distinctiveness in trivial details mm. um, every bit as much as it does in, uh, you know, 
setting service level agreements, which are because let's face it, if 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 if, if your if your table stakes are the same as everybody else's table stakes, no one's really going to comment or notice. Yep. Whereas you have that extraordinary place, the um, I think it's called the Magic Castle in Los Angeles, which is a pretty unprepossessing hotel, which always seems to be in the top 10 hotels in, on TripAdvisor. And one of the reasons is, not the only reason, I'm sure the staff are pretty great as well, they have this popsicle hotline, which is, your kids are by the pool, they pick up this red phone and go, popsicles, please. And someone comes out, their ice lollies to a British audience, and someone basically comes out with a tray of ice lollies for free. Now, it costs them almost nothing, but actually directing service gestures towards people's kids is a particularly clever thing to do, actually. Uh, you know, a good bit of evolutionary psychology here, but making a fuss of people's kids actually gratifies the parents more than if you make a fuss of them. Mm. Great bit of advice from... Um, great man called Mr. Sridhar, who ran Ogilvy in India, was always, you know, when you buy a present, buy it for the client's children. Um, you know, good Darwinian stuff. Um, and, um, uh, but, you know, uh, I, I stayed in a hotel in Portugal once, which was a pretty good hotel, but then when, because we had young children, uh, every day we came back to our room, the... Um, uh, the people doing the room had turned the towels into an elephant or a swan or something yeah. like this, which my children at the time, you know, were absolutely ecstatic. Uh, they were six, right? I'm 20, <laughs> okay? Right. You know, they were absolutely ecstatic about it, okay? You know, that sort of stuff is, in many ways, it's it's very different. You can't formularize it because the very fact that you're doing something personalized and discretionary is what gives it all the meaning. You know, mm. the degree of personalization and the degree of discretion. You know, no one would ever say, I thought that was an extremely unsatisfactory hotel because they failed to fold my towels into uh, strange animals, okay? That's exactly the point. That's why it seems amazing because politeness, good manners are to some extent discretionary effort. You know, holding a door for someone, writing a thank you letter, mm. etc. I do have an interesting debate about that in this week's Spectator, which is that... Um, there will be so much suspicion that we've got chat GPT to write our thank you letters that the only way to overcome this is to actually fill our thank you letters with profanities. <laughs> so thanks very much for the fucking di dinner party, OK? Uh, it was totally boss, you know, viva il duce. Because, of course, chat GPT can't say anything right wing and it can't say anything rude, OK? And it can't say anything opinionated. So what we'll have to do is all our personal correspondence will have to become kind of you know, absolutely profane hmm. in order for it to seem sincere. This episode is very kindly brought to you by WeWork. Now, this is particularly exciting for me because I have been a full paying customer of WeWork for the last two years now. I discovered it during, you know, when the pandemic was in the, on the verge of being lifted and I'd spent like the whole year just sort of sitting in my room making YouTube videos. But then I discovered WeWork and I was a member, me and Angus, my team members, we were members of the WeWork in Cambridge and they have like hundreds of other locations worldwide as well. And it was incredible because we had this fantastic, beautifully designed office space to go to, to work. And we found ourselves like every day, just at nine o'clock in the morning, just going to WeWork because it was a way nicer experience working from the co-working space than it was just sitting at home working. These days, what me and everyone on my team has is the all access pass, which means you're not tied to a specific WeWork location, but it means you can use any of their several hundred co-working spaces around London, around the UK, and also around the world. And one of the things I really love about the co-working setup is that it's fantastic as a bit of a change of scenery. So these days I work from home, I've got the studio at home, but if I need to get some focused writing work done and I've been, I'm have been i feeling a bit drained just sitting at my desk all day, I'll just pop over to the local WeWork, which is about a 10 minute walk from where I am. I'll take my laptop with me, I'll get some free coffee from there, I'll get a few snacks, and it's just such a great vibe and you get to meet cool people. I've made a few friends through meeting them at WeWork and it's just really nice being in an environment, almost like a library, but kind of nicer because there's like a little bit of soft music in the background and there's other kind of startup bros and creators and stuff in, in there as well. And it's just my absolute favorite co-working space of all time. It's super easy to book a desk or book a conference room using the app and it's a great place to meet up with team members if you're gonna collaborate and you all live in different places. They've got unlimited tea and coffee and herbal teas and drinks on tap and they've got soundproof booths in which to take Zoom calls and meetings. Anyway, if you're looking for a co-working space for you or your team, then I'd 100% recommend WeWork. Like I said, I've been a paying customer for theirs for the last two years, which is why it's particularly exciting that they're now sponsoring this episode. And if you want to get 50% off your first booking, then do head over to we.co forward slash Ali. And you can use the coupon code Ali at checkout ALI to get 50% off your first booking. So thank you so much, WeWork, for sponsoring this episode. I was at this uh, marketing mastermind conference type thing in Miami last week. Uh, and one of the guys gave a really good talk about um, word of mouth marketing. Yeah. Uh, and one of his main points was that 
the reason the the way you get word of mouth is by having these kind of talk triggers, yeah. having certain things about the service or something that are remarkable and therefore worth remarking on. Purple Cow, I think, there's a book by Seth Godin, where he almost suggests, I think, purple in Purple Cow, you build talkability into the product. Mm, yeah. And I often say that if you can build something into the product and imagine a stand-up, we've, we've got a, funnily enough, there's a, uh, a a brilliant creative approach I can't tell you about that Ogilvy's just come up with for the mayor of, uh, the mayor of London, okay? And it meets this perfectly, which is if you can imagine a stand-up comedian doing a routine about your product, mm. okay, um, then you're onto something, you know? You know, in other words, if it almost requires you to, uh, you know, sacrifice your own, you know, some of your own seriousness. This is what I mean about status. Okay, the urge to appear serious is, in many ways, I think, a disaster in marketing because marketing, marketing looks at the world from at a ninety degree angle to the rest of the organisation. The rest of the organisation looks at it through an efficiency lens, actually, an exploit lens, not an explore lens. Mm. And everything is an optimization problem, yep. okay? We look at things through the consumer's own eyes over time. They look at things as a snapshot aggregate, yep. okay? As a result, their view of the world is, when it comes to customers, very stupid. Because the snapshot aggregate doesn't tell you anything about your customers. In fact, it's woefully misleading because the average customer probably doesn't even exist, Okay. And so I'll give you a perfect example of that, which I've been ranting about repeatedly, which is High Speed One is a fantastic idea. By the way, it took a long time to get off the ground. I, mean, I used to use it in the early years, and you practically got a carriage to yourself. Yeah. Oh, I wonder if you can give some context on that for the oh, international audience. Sorry for yeah. the, oh gosh, international audience, <laughs> my goodness. Okay, so High Speed One runs from Kent, which is a, count, a very big county uh, and gloriously beautiful. Um, he says, as a Kent property <laughs> owner, um, uh, the um, but it's adjacent to London. But it's it at its furthest point, it's about sixty to seventy miles from central London. Okay, think of it as kind of Connecticut plus the southern bit of what is it, Massachusetts? I don't know, yeah. something like that. What that is, they built on the back of the Eurostar. They wouldn't have built it otherwise. But since there was a high speed line going to Paris. Uh, from St Pancras to the coast in Folkestone. They decided that the Eurostar didn't generate enough traffic to justify this line on its own, so they ran uh, local effectively commuter services at very high speed. So suddenly you could get from Ashford uh, to London in 37 minutes, or 30 minutes to Stratford, would you believe it? Um, whereas previously it had taken, I think, 90, if I'm right. It might have been slightly less. Um, it was certainly over an hour. OK, now, if you think about that, what that means is that someone in Ashford who decides to work in London effectively saves an hour a day, 200 times a year, probably a bit less with flexible working. But you get my point. OK, now, what the people who design railways do when they make a justification for the investment in time saving is they basically give an economic opportunity cost to all time spent on a train, okay? And they calculate the value of the time saving by the assumption, which is ludicrous, by the way, that all time spent in transit is economically unproductive. Mm. In fact, as anybody who works on a train knows, it can be the best moment of your... I fantasize about three-hour train journeys because <laughs> you can actually get <laughs> your it. shit done, exactly. right? So, so the whole premise is fucking stupid to begin with, okay? But anyway, even on that premise, okay, it doesn't distinguish between one person saving an hour 200 times a year and 200 people saving an hour once a year. Sure. Now, High Speed 2, which runs from London to Manchester, we're not going to get not many people can afford to commute from Manchester to London. And so it's not the same as Canterbury, Ashford, Folkestone, yeah. Ramsgate. Okay, it's Not the same as those places where you could conceivably work in London at least three days a week, maybe five, and pay the commuting cost. Okay, yeah. This is a journey which... All but a very, very few people take once a year, naught times a year, maybe in my case, four times a the year. London, Manchester. London, Manchester. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, saving a lot of people an hour infrequently looks the same to the statistical model as saving a few people an hour every day or very mm. frequently. Okay. 
I would argue that in psychological and behavioural terms, these things, although mathematically identical in the aggregate, yeah. are totally different. One of them means, hey, wow, I can now get a job in London, or for a Londoner, which wouldn't be a bad move, by the way, hey, wow, I can move to Canterbury, right? All right, or the seaside, deal, you know, Walmer. Sorry, I'm, I'm just helping out the local real estate. You know, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> right, okay, deal, Walmer, sandwich, okay, Broadstairs, Whitstable, okay? Now, uh, the interesting thing there is I, I think it's absolutely fallacious to treat those things as if they're commutative, as if one times 100 is the same as 100 times one. Hmm. And what a marketer would do is a marketer would say, well, how is this going to change behavior looked at through the eyes of 20 different people? And they might look at high speed two and go, meh. And they might look at high speed one and go, actually, that's a bit of a game changer. Yep. Okay, it's a niche audience, but it's a hell of a game changer. This will actually change. Bear in mind, by the way, when it was built, just to be clear, um, East Kent was, although, you know, one of the home counties, it was the only part of the southeast England where average property prices were less than five times average income. It was to some extent economically uh, a little deprived. And therefore, uh, you know, spending this money was not an unintelligent thing to do at all. So what I'm saying is that as a marketer, you will always be at odds with the rest of the organization because you're looking at things at literally orthogonal, no, or, or actually um, perpendicularly yeah. to them. They're looking at aggregates because they're reporting up to the shareholders, yeah. okay? And they're interested in just aggregate figures. How does this all add up? And where necessary, we'll take an average. What we're doing is actually taking the consumer's eye view, which is literally at 90 degrees. So this idea, by the way, that data is objective is absolutely untrue. What data tells you entirely depends on the context and the angle at which you look at it. Mm -hmm. So quite often, um, sequential, um, what, what, what's the correct term for it? Cohort data or um, longitudinal data, okay, tells a very, very different story to comparisons of snapshot data. Yeah. So now, now, just to be clear about this, okay, I'm not saying that in wealth inequality isn't a problem, okay? But I'm saying that if you want to solve the problem, you've got to actually define it properly. Mm. And one of the interesting things is that actually quite a few people will go from the poorest quartile to the richest quartile of the population in the course of their lifetime. Most data on wealth inequality, on widening wealth inequality, just compares the top and bottom quartile at one point to the top and bottom quartile at another point without not acknowledging that they're not the same people. Hmm. So, for example, a newly qualified barrister, probably very heavily in debt, probably qualifies as being notionally in the poorest decile of the population. Now, nobody thinks of that guy as poor because his prospects are pretty good. In fact, banks will lend to the guy probably pretty readily, okay? But it's, it's vitally important that we, we... The idea that when you have a chart or when you have data that it will deliver objective information regardless of how you actually interrogate it mm -hmm. is complete nonsense. You can take exactly the same data, and if you want to, you can use it to tell two completely different stories. You know, quite a lot of people... By the way, I mean, you know, one facet of wealth inequality is simply that old people are richer than poor people because they've bought... They've accumulated more shit over time, okay? Yeah. Now, you know... Now, you might argue, you could actually, interestingly, you could have a society where everybody was getting poor, which was getting poorer on average over time, but where everybody was getting richer over the course of their life, okay? Now, that actually might be a weirdly, relatively contented society, whereas a society which was getting richer on average, but where everybody was getting poorer over the course of their life, psychologically would be a completely different thing. They're both possible, by the way. I mean, they're, they're both unusual, yeah. but they're both theoretic. Both both situations are theoretical. I'm struggling to imagine this in my mind. Yeah, you? Yeah, no, no, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so you just have, in other words, you have young people who are getting much, much richer all the time and then just going into sort of total decline, okay, okay. Over, over life. But nonetheless, the aggregate population is getting richer. I mean, there are, okay, fine, there are, yeah. other, there are other debates which no one can touch um, statistically, which is... Uh, everybody treats equal opportunity as though it's one generation at a time. Okay, in other words, that you, in other words, your prospects should be independent of your parents' wealth yep. means. Sure. Okay, and it's axiomatic that equality of opportunity means that. Yep. Okay. Yep. However, 
I think we would find such a society almost intolerable. Oh, how so? Well, if, in other words, you could go from, you know, very rich parents. I mean, this must have happened in Cambodia under Pol Pot, I'm guessing. Okay. But if you had that thing where, you you know, literally people with, you know, wealthy middle class parents were forced to work in a lathe factory, regardless of what they wanted to do, etc., in the interest of fairness. Okay. Because undoubtedly, your upbringing has some bearing on your preferences. Yep. You know, uh, and actually, th- this is an interesting case because what we regard as statistically desirable might actually not be very pleasant in reality, simply because you could fall to... You've got to remember that for people to rise fast... Okay, different in the 1960s, you had massive expansion of the middle class, right? So you could have an awful lot of people could be upwardly mobile yep. at that time. Unless you actually expand the middle... I, I would argue the middle class is already uselessly large in many respects. <laughs> okay, but unless you unless you continue to expand the middle class to, to the point of absurdity... Um, you, you're not going to have that. That's not. Gonna, that's a one-off. That's not a. You know. Uh, uh, that's not a um, an eternal uh, opportunity. And actually, uh, you might argue that the price in in how far people have to fall in terms of loss aversion would actually outweigh the pleasure of the people who gained. What is marketing, and like, what got you interested in it in the first place? Um. Right. Well, very interestingly, I, as I said, there was this you know, slightly banal end of the 80s. Here's a job which isn't boring like banking, hmm. uh, and yet it's reasonably lucrative. It's not totally, you know, penurious like, um, uh, you know, publishing or something. Okay. So that, that drew me in. And then by ha- very, very happy accident, I didn't get a job in a conventional ad agency. I nearly did at two of them. Just missed out. And ended up getting a job at a place called then Ogilvy and May the Direct, which was a direct marketing agency, which is selling off the page, direct mail, um, telemarketing. Okay. Okay. Where you're sort of. And that, that was my graduate training job. And David Ogilvy actually yeah. um, recommended that anybody who wanted to be an advertising creative should spend their first four years in direct marketing learning what actually works. So, so what is direct marketing as distinct from uh, other so, forms well, of actually, marketing? Most digital marketing would probably be defined as direct marketing by the you know definition of the time. But back yeah. then, you didn't have email. I suppose you had fax marketing, telephone marketing, because. Um, uh, or it was anything which effectively sought to uh, build a relationship with the person you're selling to. So you found their name and address at the time, which meant you could send them direct mail. Or you mailed them for acquisition. You used direct mail for acquisition. Or you, um, uh, uh, you know, or, or you operated a call center. So it was anything where there was a one-to-one contact, direct, because as distinct from marketing products which are sold through intermediaries, like supermarkets, okay? Okay, so like so a, if, a TV if ad Dove, is... If Dove writes to a yeah. consumer, that's direct marketing, yeah. okay? If Dove places an ad on TV and you walk into Tesco's and buy some Dove, yeah. that's not, okay? Oh, fine. Got, got it? Uh, yeah. Got it. Mm-hmm. So a Facebook ad would be, uh, well... Y- yes, it like probably a... is because you know who it is who's... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we never realized we were going to create that monster uh, in a way. And it's gone from being, um, direct marketing's probably gone from being underused to overused. Actually. Oh, okay. How so? A typical neophilia. You know, when a new product, when a new um, medium comes along, we tend to overweight the things the new medium allows you to do that the, the old one didn't. Yep. Okay. And we underweight things that the old one did that the new one doesn't do very well. Sure. It's rather like the Kindle. You know, when, I, when, when the Kindle first came along, I naively said, oh, this is just going to replace books. Mm. Now, of course, it doesn't replace books because, okay, probably about 40% of books are bought as gifts mm. in by volume. I don't yep. know about by value. Okay. Um, you know, Christmas is a huge swatch of the publishing game. Mm. The biggest categories in books are kind of, well, cookery gardening, lifestyle, architecture, that kind of shit, which requires really high quality photography, yeah. okay? Um, so actually, you know, the Kindle isn't going to do either of those two jobs, just to, just from the off. If it's purely textual, non-fiction, reference, huge advantages there. If the person buying the, the book travels a lot and loves the fact that they can be sitting at 35,000 feet and over Wi-Fi can buy a copy of a novel... That's miraculous, okay? And don't get me wrong. It's a fantastic advantage over conventional books. But equally, uh, we're in danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, which I think we're doing with marketing as well, to the same extent. We're forgetting what... In other words, 
being able to measure and to quantify and to justify your spend in direct media, which was always what made them different to some extent. There was a direct attributable measurement of behavioural change yep. as a result of your particular um, uh, your particular piece of stimulus ad. Okay. Yep. Um, uh, actually, by the way, it was not nearly as direct and attributable because obviously if you're doing direct marketing for a strong brand like American Express, which was a big advertiser, mm. you've got a proportionally much bigger response than if you're advertising for someone uh, on behalf of someone they'd never heard of. So it was a bit of a nonsense to claim that the uh, the you know the value of the uh, of the acquisition was entirely attributable to the letter you sent the customer. Sure. Okay. Um, but nonetheless, you know, that measurability was valuable. But unfortunately, people have got so obsessed with it that they're now unable to do anything that you can't perfectly quantify. Yeah. And actually, there are quite a lot of valuable marketing activities, which I would argue are actually probabilistic. Oh. You know, you just make a load of noise because I can't tell to a great degree of exactitude who my customers are going to be in five years' time. So the best thing I can do is make sure they've heard of me so that should they enter the market for the product I sell, they at least consider what I have to provide. Yeah. Okay. And it's doing it backwards. In other words, let's not try and find the customers. Let's make sure the customers know a lot of, enough about us that they'll come and find us. And they're, they're complementary, by the way. You know, you can do both. They're not mutually exclusive. Mm. But because the one is both harder to measure and slower to reveal its results... Yeah than the other, we've disproportionately favoured what's quantifiable over what's important. Okay, so it's quantification bias again. It's that same thing all over again. I was sometimes called the... Um, who the hell was the guy who kind of um, was behind the Vietnam War, metrics in the Vietnam War, which was, it, it, it's, it's occasionally called... I'll remember his name in a second. Um, the, the problem it creates, there are many, many long-term things which will never be measurable or attributable simply because in between the initial stimulus and the eventual purchase, too much happens. Yeah. I mean, famously, someone said to, to Jeremy Bullmore, they said, the um, great, wonderful advertising guru who died earlier this year at 92, they said, it, you know, I've just bought an Aston Martin. It won't surprise you to know I bought the Aston Martin as the result of an advertisement I saw. What may surprise you is I saw that advertisement when I was 12 years old. Okay. And so, you know, a large part of this stuff is probabilistic. I'll, well, the, the perfect demonstration of this to me was if I'd sat down and said, who is the target audience for my book, Alchemy? I would have defined it in terms of people interested in marketing, people interested in psychology, people interested in behavioral science. And those people, it's true, are disproportionately interested in this kind of thing. But outside those areas of interest, there are probably another million people who would be who would quite enjoy reading the book out of curiosity. Yeah. And one day, it was June, I think, in about 2018, if I got this right. Might have been, yeah. Um, I appear on the Chris Evans breakfast show, audience of about a million people. And Chris Evans interviews me about the book. Um, uh, and, you know, I give a reasonably good account of things. What I didn't know is that Chris then went to the beach because it was being broadcast from Cannes, from the advertising festival. And one of Chris's assistants had just read the book and said, mm. Chris, you'll like this. And this guy's probably in Cannes because he works in advertising. Mm. The following day, which I didn't know because I was pottering around, obviously not listening to Virgin because I was in France. Okay. Chris had finished the book and was raving about it, quoting from it and everything else. The first I got to know about this was I went onto Amazon to look at the sales ranking, okay? And I was outsell I outsold JK Rowling for about a week. I outsell I couldn't outsell the book of Nom. Um I outsold the, hi the Highway Code and I outsold the Hungry Little Caterpillar for a day, I think, okay? Um okay. Uh but what was interesting was that it was entirely the result of the radio program reaching audiences you in other words, you never would have defined in advance, okay? I, mean, I, was, I think I was number eight on Amazon overall for a few days. And I suddenly realized, okay, you know, there are two directions. This is what bees do, you know. There's exploit, explore. Mm. There's, we know where the pollen is, let's go and get more of it. And there's, this supply of pollen um, is not the sum total of available resources. Yeah. We need to explore elsewhere, partly to future-proof the hive yeah. against you know, a sudden depletion of your existing supply, okay? And partly, by the way, just for the chance of getting lucky. Hmm. 
You know, if you don't actually invest a certain amount in explore rather than exploit, you'll never have a kind of big bonanza upside discovery. You'll never have a pleasant surprise. You'll only have nasty surprises. Yeah. Which is interesting because when you think about it, most businesses are optimized around exploit. Yeah. Once they pass the entrepreneurial phase, it's okay. We know what we're doing now. Let's just do more of it more efficiently. Mm. And in the short term, of course, it's great. That, you know, if you got rid of the random bees who troll around looking for pollen at random, yep, in the short term, your pollen and nectar collection figures would look more impressive. The problem is, is that it's downhill from there on. Mm. You, know, you can't cost cut your way to growth, putting it another way. All righty. So on this point about kind of defining your audience, um, we were having, honestly, like sort of before you came here, we were having a bit of a dilemma tr tr trying to figure out like, who is the target audience for a conversation like this? And then that got us thinking, who's the target audience for the podcast? Because we have like an average of like who I kind of think is the person who watches, watches the podcast, which is probably male, probably in the West, probably a few years younger than me. So maybe in like early to mid 20s, probably has like a normal job, normal job, uh, probably is keen to start some kind of side hustle because they like the idea of financial independence. But that's like, we have a huge audience on the YouTube channel, the podcast, which is all of the world around about 60, 40, male, female, like all sorts of age groups, people from, you know, I get emails from people who are in their 60s who listen to the podcast. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. like so any any ideas on, on how to strike this balance between it's worth defining a target audience versus it's not worth defining a target audience? Uh, one thing that people get muddled up with is user imagery versus target audience. Okay. Because if you look at ads for small cars, they will almost certainly show the car being driven around by a sort of, 32-year-old, 28-year-old, typically female person, which is the user imagery, okay? Overwhelmingly, all new cars are bought by the relatively elderly. All cars bought from new. Uh, I think the average age of a Volkswagen buyer is probably about 54. New. Oh, wow. A new okay. Volkswagen. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I, I've only had two new... No, I've only had one new car in my entire life. In fact, I'm 57. Okay, maybe I had two. Okay. Now... The difference there is that um, if there are some wealthy, uh, you know, 28-year-old females who are buying brand new Peugeot, you know, 20 whatevers, okay? Now, the reason you use them as the user imagery is if you show 27-year-old girls driving the car, 58-year-old um, or 64-year-old retirees don't mind buying it. But if you show the car being driven by 65-year-olds, you'll entirely lose your 28-year-old audience. Yeah. So there's a kind of interesting idea of who you're talking to, okay, or who you feature as your user imagery. But that don't let don't ever get confused that that's actually your target audience. Ah, okay. Okay. And actually, by the way, if you look at the work of Byron Sharp, uh, if you look at the marketing work of um, uh, also probably Mark Ritson and other people, uh, also Bennett and Field, I'm quoting sort of uh, pretty good academics. Uh, most, most brands are actually bought as part of a repertoire. And what distinguishes leading brands is that more people buy them sometimes, and the people who buy them sometimes tend to buy them more often. Sorry, more people uh, buy them sometimes. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> I've got a perfect expression yeah. for this, which is my favorite end line of all time in advertising, which is the most interesting man in the world for Dos Equis, who says, uh, I do not always drink beer, but when I do, I prefer Dos Equis. Okay. Stay thirsty, my friend. He's got a Hemingway-esque character, okay? Now, of course, the most interesting man in the world wouldn't only drink beer, okay? And he wouldn't even stick to one brand of beer. Mm. But what he does is he doesn't always drink beer, but when he does drink beer, he tends to drink Dos Equis. Okay. And if you have more of those people than your competitors, then you're the leading brand. It's not a matter of perfect loyalty. So it's like the high In most too. categories. <laughs> it, it, exactly, yeah. <laughs> And so yeah. that, you know, it's important actually to understand these things. I mean, one of the things I don't think is understood as well is that um, one thing that's increasingly interesting me is what are the products that nobody wants, but that once you've experienced them, they fundamentally um, 
create a, a convert or a, mm. um, a, a even an evangelist. Japanese toilet seats. You've got it exactly. Japanese <laughs> toilet seats. One air fryers, probably another. Okay, where weirdly nobody wants the thing. Everybody is, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. And then anybody who owns one of the people who own them, about fifty percent of people effectively become swivel eyed. Yeah, evangelize and slightly, the product. Evangelize. That's why I bought an air fryer. <laughs> and it occurred to me that one of the important roles of advertising. And by the way, this is much much easier for products you use frequently than products you use infrequently. Mm. One of the things I was watching um, on YouTube, little little listener tip, YouTube Premium. Nobody has it, but it's the best value thing I you'll know, ever buy. Absolutely incredible. Okay, ad-free YouTube. We, we, didn't, we didn't buy it when YouTube first came out because YouTube was full of slightly grainy, shot on a wobbly phone, you know, yeah. kind of low-resolution stuff. I mean, huge swathes of it are now kind of 4K broadcast quality, watch it on your 55-inch telly. Mm. And it's only a year or two away from becoming Wikipedia with video mm. because the volume of what's on YouTube is now so unbelievably kind of comprehensive that actually you can use YouTube pretty much in the way that you use Wikipedia, in fact, mm. okay? Um, but anyway, sorry, part that. Um, I was watching a YouTube video which was a kind of – cut down of the dragon's den which for american listeners is known as shark tank in the u.s and it featured the the worst mistakes that the dragons had made okay the trunky suitcase the ride-on suitcase was one okay uh, i can't remember the other one but the most egregious one was effectively a a, a brand called hungry house which ended up being sold to a German company and then sold to, to Just Eat for, I think, £220 million, okay? So missing that was clearly a mistake, okay? And they were all having arguments. This is this exactly back to this point about the, uh, is it 100 people doing, is it 100 people doing something once or is it one person doing something 100 times, yep. Okay. And I, I kind of went and analysed this. By the way, I don't, I don't want, want you to think that I regard, you know, Dragon's Den or The Apprentice as kind of somehow emblematic of business. They're extraordinarily ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I worry about it, actually, the extent to which most people's view of free market capitalism must be coloured by The Dragon's Den or The Apprentice. Oh, yeah. Which are, you know, absurd. I mean, in many ways. Okay, they're wonderful, but they're absurd. I mean, we, uh, just on that note, um, the person we interviewed last week um, made it to the final, like, 10 for The Apprentice. But they said her business plan was too good and she should just get investment and start a business, which she did, uh, <laughs> rather than rather actually than go actually on the show. Rather than actually winning the program. Yeah, because, the, 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 because it said to her, look, we're going to be honest, the show is entertainment. Your business plan is too good. Uh, so just execute on that. <laughs> and so she wasn't on the show. Brilliant. Now, but, the interesting yeah. thing there is that I looked at this and thought, how did you miss it? And they were having an argument with Deborah Mead and having an argument with, you know, um, I, I think it was. Bannertine, yeah. about, you know, how, w w now bear in mind, this was in the either late 90s, early 2000s. There was an argument about whether people would actually order takeaway food for delivery or collection over the web at all, okay? Yeah. Sounds ridiculous now, but there was an early attempt to do pizza ordering online in the late 90s, which failed hmm. because people said, well, I just pick up the phone because their level of confidence in it was so low yep. that you typically order your pizzas online and then ring up the pizza place to go, did you get my internet order? Okay, mm -hmm. well, that's clearly not a benefit to anybody, okay? But anyway, it suddenly occurred to me that the question they failed to ask the people who are running Hungry House, which was the only question that mattered, was this. When people use your product or service once, do they go on using it? Or a secondary question, which may be a catch you know, kind of safety net. When people use your product three times, do they go on using it? In other words, now, this comes to a fairly philosophical point in both economics and anything else, okay, which is that there are certain things which it is pointless to speculate about in advance because the act of owning them or using them fundamentally changes your utility function and your preferences, okay? okay. Now, the most extreme case, and Russ Roberts of the utterly brilliant um, Econ Talk podcast, mm. okay? Russ Roberts talks about this, having children, okay? Yeah. Um, from the point of view of a single couple or a single person, it's an utterly stupid decision, having children, okay? Because all the things you enjoy as a single person become either impossible or really expensive. You know, every time you stay in a hotel, you're paying for 
two rooms out of one salary when you were paying for one room out of two salaries. So now staying at the travel lodge is probably more expensive than staying at the Intercontinental before. You can't go out to nightclubs without getting babysitting. All the shit you really enjoy is more or less destroyed and the buggers are really, really expensive, okay? <laughs> it's a terrible decision having children, except for the fact that once you have children, thanks to evolutionary psychology... All your preferences, your priorities, and your idea of utility completely changes. Yeah. Okay? So that those things become comparatively much less important mm. and the you know, the well being and happiness of your children become correspondingly more important. Now mm. at a kind of slightly banal level, a Japanese toilet is the same, okay? Mm. That until you've actually tried it, yep. once you've tried a Japanese toilet, okay, going back to a basic Western toilet is as yawning a gulf as going from a Western dry wipe toilet to shitting in a hole in the garden. That's that's about the comparative distance in terms of perception, okay? Yeah. Um, now, similarly, an air fryer, once you've had it, no going, multi-channel TV, mobile phone, mm. probably the electric car, interestingly. Mm. Yeah. Now, it strikes me that one of the things we fail to do with a lot of dot-com ideas is ask... How frequently will this be used? Because those things, mobile phone, multi-channel TV, electric car, air fryer, uh, Japanese toilet, are all things which, by definition, assuming you've got reasonable bowel health, you're going to use every day, <laughs> yep. okay? Or at least every two days, sure. okay? You know. All right? Now, those things change your fundamentally. If, if you do something differently frequently, I park a lot at the station, so the parking app kind of changes my whole view of parking okay um if you only park once a year i would argue that you know uh, actually a, a, a parking app is a pain in the ass okay yes if you only if you only actually park in a station car park once a year the fact that you now have to um use an app to park there mm. for my dad who doesn't even have a smartphone it's actually a uh, a complete obstacle for other people it's a monstrous pain yeah and by the way we're not treating the elderly very well with tech mm. okay we are up, you know, tech should be enabling people to stay in their homes for longer, and if anything, it's creating actually, uh, you know, unbelievable obstacles. My, my dad was selling books in his mid to late eighties. Was selling books on Amazon. Okay, he's not a techno um, luddite by any means, but he says at the age of ninety two, he said, "I've just got to a point where resetting my password is you know, doesn't say mind fuck, but that's what he means." Okay, and. Um, you know, we haven't we haven't thought those things through adequately at all. But that frequency thing really interests me because mm. I see a lot of dot com ideas and I go, well, this is a great idea in theory, but actually it's a it's it's a hundred thousand people doing something once. Yep. What you really need is actually to get something started, it's uh, ten thousand people doing something once a week or once a day. Because rather like having children, those are the things where once, to quote the the Vauxhall end line of the 2000s, once driven, forever smitten, that the act of owning it, of doing it. Nobody in Britain wanted multi-channel TV back in the um, 80s and 90s. They were a stupid American thing. They just a load of rubbish on, you know, what's wrong with four channels? Yeah. Okay. But nobody who had multi-channel TV ever went back. Mm. And I don't think we ask this question what I might call the the longitudinal question, nearly enough, because everybody's looking at the sales, the aggregate sales figures for electric cars. Okay, the real question you need to ask if you want to predict where the market's going is: of the people who buy electric cars, how many of them revert? Mm. In other words, is yep. this a one-way street where once owned, your fundamental preferences yeah. are so changed by the experience of the alternative one thing i always thought was a bit like that if i'm being absolutely candid about it which had a lot of resistance but nobody ever went back was driving an automatic okay okay yeah. Yeah, loads of brits used to talk about bollocks like no i miss the sense of control yeah. you know <laughs> all that sort of stuff now the reason brits didn't drive automatics was that many american sorry many british cars of the 50s and 60s were so bloody weedy Okay, you needed a manual transmission just to get up a bloody hill. Mm. Okay, uh, and also automatics only had typically three speeds. Now, a big American V8 had no trouble handling that, but a Morris Minor would have basically ground to a halt. Yep. Good bit of trivia, by the way. The Morris Minor, um, if I've got this right, engine, mm. the 1200cc probably engine, was also the starter motor 
um, for the Centurion tank. Oh, okay. Right. So, okay, that's a, that's a good bit of trivia. <laughs> so it was so fe- it was so feeble in the sense yeah. that it was actually, when you put it in a tank, it was merely the starter motor. Yeah. But um, uh, but actually, everybody talks this crap about automatics. But everybody who drives an automatic goes, "Well, oh, sod that manual for a game of soldiers." You know, very mm. you know because now don't get me wrong. If I lived in the north of Scotland, just off the A nine, okay, and I had long, glorious, winding open roads. I'd probably revert to a manual for the pleasure of kind of, you know, you know, gear changing and control. Yep. Most of my driving is either on a motorway where you just drive along at a constant speed or I'm stuck in traffic. Yep. Now, in both those situations, or actually even more extreme, I'm manoeuvring in a car park yep. where I much prefer the creep that you enjoy through an automatic because mm. you can manoeuver at very slow speeds without running over dogs and things, okay? <laughs> yep. Now... You know, I think that's a typical case where nobody wants it, but once you've experienced it, what yep. you want fundamentally changes. So there's probably an important role for advertising in just generating trial and accelerating take-up because the two big forces in human instinct are social copying, do what everybody else does, and habit, do what I've done before. Okay, yep. And as a result, behaviour change tends to take on a sigmoid curve shape. And it occurred to me that people who don't know this may have been writing off lots of products too early because they failed to realise that most new significant ideas are very slow to take off at the beginning. I mean, there were mobile phones in Britain in the 1970s. My father's business partner had one uh, where uh, you basically radioed a great big aerial and you said, can you please put me through to yep. Raglan 201? And someone put... But it was a car phone, yep. okay? And so those things existed for years. And then, okay, part of it was technological improvement. Part of it was just yeah. people then experienced them. People who a year earlier had said, why would I want to make a phone call in the street? Mm. I, I used a mobile phone in Oxford Street, 1989. Two people rolled down the windows of taxis and shouted abuse at me. Oh, wow. Okay, 1989. Yeah. Someone's visibly using a mobile phone on Oxford Street. This, yeah. wasn't, you know, this wasn't in the depths of the countryside where they thought it was witchcraft on yeah. Oxford Street. And they actually pulled down a taxi window and went wanker. Okay? Yeah. Right? Now, that no, it was only, okay, it was seven years before, you know, to take that technology to the mainstream. Yep. But it, you know, it always occurred to me, I think they, I think they, they bailed on Google Glass much too early, mm. for example. Yeah. You know, four years later, three years later, I would have been pissed at an airport and I would have just bought bought it, you know. And, I, you know, I think it's very important we realise this because if you think that adoption of things is linear, you will often give up too soon. The question you need to ask is not how fast are we growing, it's how sticky is this product. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on brand redesigns? Because we're having this issue, well, yeah, a bit of an issue right now in that for the YouTube channel and for the podcast and stuff, we've done a bit of a rebrand and I think I think the new one looks pretty sick. But there's a lot of people on our team being like, oh, it doesn't look as friendly or as nice as like the old one did. And it strikes me that I remember... Is there a recognisable yeah. line from one to the other? Is this a refresh or a re- complete rebrand? Um, I think there's a little bit of a recognisable line. It's like, okay, I can see that this is this rebrand or refresh is... Uh, sort of making everything a little bit more consistent, mm. whereas previously it was a bit of a hodgepodge of different things. And it kind of got me thinking about when, back when Facebook really, was a thing. Be really, really careful, by the way, because yeah. the extent to which we select icons, and often we select a podcast through a kind of icon, mm. okay, the extent to which that's an unconscious thing, yeah. which will be completely, you know, kiboshed yeah. by, by too great a change of colour, yeah. You got, I think you've got to be really goddamn careful there. Mm. Um, particularly given the kind of choice architecture around which podcast shall I listen to now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you might want to look at a migra- a slower migration. Mm. I mean, it's always notable that at no point does anybody come, although I think it's becoming increasingly a terrible site, by the way. No one's ever turned up at the Amazon website and thought, what the hell's going on here? Yeah. Okay. You know, the, the whole thing has been an evolution. Very slow changes over time. I think I think if I'm right, they basically allow, which is a mistake, by the way, mm. they allow algorithms pretty much to, to determine the site now. So there's continuous testing on the background of small things. That does mean that there is ultimately the opportunity for someone to come along and completely wrong foot them. I mean, it always baffles me, by the way, that 
uh, that Shopify hasn't created a search engine. Yeah, they really should. <laughs> yeah. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. I did ask the guy once. And they said, oh, we, it would be unfair because it would mean we're discriminating between our customers. And I thought, well, the customers would much prefer to get five times the business and for a competitor to yeah. get seven <laughs> times the business than to stay along in this kind of, you know, in what you might call egalitarian obscurity. Mm. Like, it's so nice when something is on Shopify and has shop pay as an option. Yes, isn't like it just? Card yeah, details yeah. say, oh, it's, it's, almost e- it's almost easier than Amazon <laughs> at that point. But also, also the ability to select by, um, I mean, this is something that's really fascinating. The whole question mm. of choice architecture is one of the really, really robust findings of behavioral science. Mm. And the way you present a choice to people, okay, uh, will f- and the order in which they're asked to eliminate things by attribute okay, will have an enormous effect on what they end up choosing. Okay, what do you mean the order in which they... Uh, Right. Well, an example would be, um, let's imagine, okay, we bought art the way we bought property. So alongside, say, prime location or right move, there was a thing called right art, okay? And you went, I like something about five feet by three feet, um, featuring two goats and a cow, uh, mostly blue, but with a smattering of pinks, okay, between these two price points, yeah. okay? In that world, Picassos would be really cheap because they'd hardly ever show up, yeah. okay? And now, obviously, we don't buy art like that, but is it right that we buy property with aesthetics and design because they're harder to quantify so far down the decision tree that all you end up doing is you go location, price, number of bedrooms. Number of bedrooms is a terrible metric, by the way, because it means that every single person dealing property has an incentive to provide lots of totally tiny bedrooms, okay? And as a result, we have too few toilets, too few bathrooms, uh, you know, and instead of having what every house needs actually is one really big room, Mm. okay, right? Instead of that, you know, you have you have too many rooms that are too small and too few rooms that aren't bedrooms, arguably, okay? And so that's a distortion. I mean, in Europe and the US, they tend to do it by square footage or square meterage. But then, okay, what if you what if you change things? Now, okay, there's a website that does this, the modernhouse.net, okay? And the modernhouse.net basically makes some sort of architectural distinction a prerequisite for appearing on the site. Yeah. Now, if you had a Parker score for... This is my weird observation that architecture is the cheapest way to buy art because really good architecture for a given location and size of property only adds about 1% or 2% to the price of a house. Mm. Place actually at the Isocon up in Hampstead, I think it's one bedroom flat. Uh, Absolute, you know, kind of a modernist masterpiece, okay? Uh, There's a place near Tunbridge for sale, which is actually by Gropius and Fry. No premium, as far as I can see, over any house nearby. Now, you know, that's weird, right? Okay? It seems weird to me Hmm. that, you know, people will pay an enormous amount of money to own a painting by a great artist compared to an indifferent artist. I live in the roof of a Robert Adam house, my next-door neighbour in the flat next door is an economist. I said, how much do we actually pay as a premium for the fact that this is a Robert Adam house uh, rather than just some random piece of shit of the same location? He said, I wondered about that. He said, it's somewhere between naught and 2%. Now, that's crazy, right? Because presumably aesthetics, you know, unless I'm wrong about everything, mm. aesthetics and design can contribute quite significantly to happiness. Yeah. We'd much rather own a house. Or you could argue, by the way, the right, the best measure on right move would be how attractive the house opposite is. Because that's what you're looking at. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah. I, I lived in Westbourne Park Villas when I first moved to London in a place back, backing onto the Paddington railway tracks, which was, to be honest, a bit of a shithole. Mm. But we woke up in the morning and looked at a sort of £1 million house on Westbourne Park Villas. Yeah. And I always felt sorry for them because they'd paid <laughs> £1.4 million to look at us. Um, but what I'm saying is that in many cases, the way we choose is based on kind of arbitrary, um, uh, you know, I mean, one of the most peculiar things that's happening in property at the moment, by the way, uh, is that you must never, ever try and sell a house for £675,000. Because all the property websites have, at that price point, it's 650000 700000 I think. Mm. It might be 600000 I th- I, 700,000, but I think they stop at 50,000 increments. Yeah. If you price your house at 25, you're in between two. Mm. And so the people searching uh, 
600 and up or the people searching 650 and down are less likely to find you yep. and so your house won't sell so now you don't have a price demand curve you have a price demand ziggurat yeah okay yep. that's the example of how how you present choice will distort a market yeah. The reason, by the way, these Amazon brands are all called Wiglulu, Amazon Marketplace brands, mm. right? Do, do, do you know why? No, why is that? Because I was going, geez, I, I was thinking, I'm going to emigrate to Shanghai and just become a branding expert by saying, next time, rather than using a set of Scrabble tiles to, to name your brand, why don't you actually have something that's memorable and suggests you're actually on the business of building a brand reputation? rather than just using random vowels and consonants like a really bad round of countdown, okay? Mm. You know, a oh, vowel, please, Carol, and another vowel, and another vowel, yeah. okay? Right. Okay, Carol, I said Carol. Oh, oh God, I'm cool. showing my yeah. age there, aren't I? Okay, <laughs> Rachel, isn't yeah. it? Sorry. Um, um, now, here's what's really weird about this, okay, which is that the algorithm gives priority to brands, inverted commas, which are trademarked in the US. Oh, okay. It's much easier and much faster to tra trademark a random collection of consonants and vowels yeah. than it is to try... If I tried to trademark, you know, Sutherland camping equipment, okay, it would probably take me ages and then some lawyer would pitch up from fucking Wyoming <laughs> going, there's a Mr. Sutherland here who runs a fucking tent shop. And, you, know, you know, you can just imagine the whole thing, Okay. <laughs> Whereas if it's extremely unlikely anybody's going to challenge your right to call yourself, right? Yeah. So all they're doing is creating a name that's really easy to legally trademark so they can game the algorithm. It's yeah. not in the interest of the consumer mm. at all, yeah. right? What's in the interest of the consumer is recognizable brand names like, you know, even if they're Amazon-owned brands like Anchor or whatever or yeah. Ugreen, mm. which we can – Buy more of if we like what we buy and buy less of if we don't like it. Brands are basically the units of selection in the evolutionary marketplace, which is consumer capitalism, okay? And a brand name allows you collectively and individually to reward a good experience with future business and to punish a bad experience with a future boycott. Mm. So anybody who's interested in the longevity of their business will try and live up to their promises if that promise is attached to a brand, okay? If that promise is attached to Ryugu, right, you won't because you've got no investment in that. You, it's just one of 47 other yeah. Scrabble tiles that you've got. Now, this fact that brands are actually essential to the workings of consumer capitalism because they're the units of selection – is totally overlooked as far as I can see. Brands actually lead to better products. The absence of brands often destroys markets because nobody can confidently make a decision yep. within them, mm. okay? And it strikes me that Amazon, by making that thing, is it a registered trademark rather than is it actually a pronounceable word, mm. okay, uh, is doing a complete disservice uh, it's 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 contributing to the I think I think if I'm right, Cory Doctorow calls the inshitification. You know, he, he various people have started writing in the Atlantic about something I noticed about a year and a half ago, which is that quite a lot of mainstream massive things, Google, Facebook, Amazon, which for the first fifteen years were extremely admirable, okay, have started to get worse. Yep. Google started to get worse because uh, patently the ads used to be on the right and the, and, and the native search used to be on the left. Now, if you try and find out the phone number of a hotel, it's a living bloody nightmare, right? Mm. Because 76 competing hotels will start appearing all over the place, mm. right? That's in shitification because it's moved from serving the consumer to serving the advertiser. And then eventually you stop serving even the advertiser and you just start serving yourself. Uh, Amazon, I think, you know, if I search for Samsung televisions, mate, okay, imagine a human being, I go into Curry's, right, and go, I'd like to look at Samsung televisions, please. Now, he is perfectly at liberty to say, well, if I were you, I'd have a Deco at LG as well, okay, that's within his rights as an expert salesman, mm. perhaps. But, okay, if I search for Samsung televisions, I expect my search to include some Samsung televisions. Mm. How fucking ridiculous, it's hardly, a, you know, too much to ask, is it, right? I feel like when a lot of people hear the word marketing or advertising, mm -hmm. they're immediately, they're, they, it gets the hackles up because it feels salesman-y and even the word sales feels like evil in some way. How, like, as someone who's worked in marketing for the last, like, I 
40 years or so. Like, what's what's your take on why that is? And the and funny thing is... What's um, going on there? The bits of advertising that really annoy people mostly aren't produced by advertising agencies. So if you get the accusation, it makes people want things they don't need. Well, that's a bit of a complex point anyway, because on an average day, a human being needs about 1,500 calories, okay? Um, you know, I don't know, 120 litres of air and a warm, dry place, okay? Everything else is a want yeah. at some level, okay? So the whole thing about want... I mean, it's very interesting, by the way, to read... Um, uh, there was a left-wing anti-advertising pamphlet from the 1960s. And it said, you know, in many ways, advertising has obviated many of the great achievements that we've had in enriching the working class, because it turns out that the working class just spend their money on pointless luxuries. <laughs> Wait for this. Okay. Like washing machines. <laughs> okay. I'm, actually, hold on a second. Okay. If you're a working class family in 1960, your mum would have had some sort of tub mechanism with a mangle and a whole day of her life would have been spent doing the household laundry. And yet you're referring to a washing machine as a pointless luxury. You know, this is, a, you know, I mean, it's worth noting that one, you know, what you know, in the 1960s, a washing machine was seen as a massive extravagance, mm. you see, and, and therefore for some reason, the working classes weren't supposed to buy them. I mean, outrageous kind of nonsense. So anyway, never mind. We've got to ask this question of what's a want and what's a need. Most of the luxury good stuff is done in-house. And quite a bit of it is done to keep uh, luxury goods publications happy. It's not only to reach the consumer. Yeah. It's also to ensure if you advertise extensively in fashion publications, you'll get featured a bit more. Mm. OK, so there, there, there are all kinds of other things going on. Uh, for example, the vast majority of my time, which hasn't been in B2B marketing, some of some of it has, the vast majority of my time spent in advertising has been, um, uh, uh, OK, promoting broadband for BT, promoting the American Express card early on, um, uh, promoting vaping or alternatives to smoking, okay? So any form of behavioral change, whether for good or bad, does require um, communication, yep. okay? It's, you know, uh, at the very least, it might happen anyway, but it'll happen more slowly if you don't advertise it, yep. for example. And, um, uh, you know, actually most advertising now is compare the meerkat you know, okay, there's a certain amount for alcohol, there's a certain amount for, you know, luxury goods. What advertising agencies are mostly doing is, by the way, most people in ad agencies lean left wing, by the way. You wouldn't expect this. In drama, in kind of, you know, in, in the kind of what you might call the dramatic depiction of an ad agency, it's yeah. a load of cynical right wing bastards. Yeah. Most people are pink. I mean, most people... You know, most of my young colleagues are way to the left of me. And generally, they don't have a problem with what they're selling. Okay. You know, even yeah. Gen Z go, okay, you know, okay, electric cars, another thing I've been engaged in. You know, so that now that's interesting because in the electric car world, for example, let's look at it as a category, not just as individual brands. Mm. To an enormous extent, okay, range anxiety, which is the big obstacle and the yep. thing. Now, individual brands are always talking about range because yep. that's the thing they've got to actually convince the consumer about. Yep. And that's how they compete with other electric car brands. The only problem is that the universal conversation about range is actually, in a sense, creating a fear yep. or magnifying a fear that doesn't need to be that present. Okay, now let me explain why. Okay, um, so I don't have car charging at home. I'm going to get it, but I haven't got around to it. Yep. My wife has a mini electric, which has about 100 miles range. I've got the Ford Mustang Mach-E, which has about 250, the extended range. Okay. What I suddenly realized, once you own an electric car and once you actually overcome this anxiety, is that... Now, this wouldn't be true, okay, just to, be, just to caveat it, if you lived in an obscure part of North Wales or yep. somewhere weird in Scotland, this may not be true. But for most Brits, most of the time, range anxiety is a perfectly rational American fear, yep. which doesn't apply to the UK, really, okay? Not a very big country, okay? You know, in, in America, it's not uncommon for your parents to live 400 miles away, okay? And you've got to go and visit them over a weekend, because let's face it, you get no bloody vacation, yep. okay? Right? That, that's, by the way, if I'm an American, yeah. okay, my plan to stand for president of the United States is slightly kiboshed by the fact that I wasn't uh, born there. Although, funnily enough, 
Woodrow Wilson is something like my second cousin. His mum was born in, in England. He's actually oh. my second cousin, three times removed or something. I was a bit of a freak. Um, but all I'd stand on is the platform of four weeks paid vacation. I wouldn't mm. bother with any of the other stuff. We're talking electric cars, range uh, anxiety. Yeah, electric cars, range anxiety. Okay. Yeah. So we've got trains as an alternative. If I had to go to Manchester for the day, I wouldn't drive anyway. Yeah. Okay, if I had to go to Manchester overnight, I probably wouldn't drive. Mm. Okay, If I had to go to Manchester for five days, I would drive. But then it's a leisurely trip up and I'm going to stop somewhere and, you know, go and visit a country house or something or, you know, whatever. Okay. And I'm going to find somewhere to charge. And also... Uh, I can't, you know, in the UK, driving traffic density being such, you can't really drive for three hours without taking a break anyway. It's not healthy or sensible to do it. You can on an interstate in the US because it's just such a chill experience by contrast. Secondly, when I get to my dad's house, he's got 240 volts. Now, it's not seven kilowatts, but it's three, three and a half. And actually, if I arrive with a 50% tank and I plug in to his ordinary outdoor socket, I'll be up to about 85% by the time I leave in the morning, okay? Well, that's way more than enough to get me to the next rapid charger should I need one. We don't have really extreme cold very often, okay? Uh, as I said, we've got three kilowatts at home. We have the alternative of a train. We don't do very long drives. And also, this is a very high-density country. So in the US, you need gas stations to serve a geography, not just a population. OK, because if you're halfway between, say, Taos, New Mexico and Farmington, if you don't have a gas station somewhere en route, nobody can actually make the journey. Yep. OK, now in the UK, I, did, I, I went and checked this out. OK, the UK has about 8,500 petrol stations. In the US, they got about 116,000. And the reason they need a multiplier more proportional to the population is because of the geographical coverage. Yep. Now, in the UK, it's not like, oh, shit, we're on the I-40 between so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so and, -so, and if the next charge is out of action, we're basically going to have to spend the night in an Idaho truck. No, that's not on I-40, is it? Okay, I don't know what that is. I, I something else, 80, I don't know. Okay, well, you know, we're going to have to spend the night in an Idaho truck stop in the freezing cold while the radio tells us that a serial killer's just escaped from the local <laughs> penitentiary, okay? In Britain, it would be, oh, dear, this charger is broken. Oh, look, there's another one two miles down the road. Yeah. Yeah. next to a tea shop, so we'll stock up on scones and buns, okay, uh, while the car's charging. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different kind of thing, okay? Mm. You're not in the middle of nowhere in Britain, um, okay? And so actually what we've done is we've imported a fear into the Netherlands and the UK in particular, which is perfectly relevant to Americans, and I, I, I get it, mm. okay? Actually in the UK, now, nah, yeah. okay? I've got, I've got a cafe with a charger, 50 feet away, rapid charger. I've got a Waitrose with a couple of them. I've got a Tesco with a couple of slow chargers. I've got an Indian restaurant with a rapid... Well, actually, that's all you need. Yeah. Actually, an Indian restaurant, a rapid charger, job done. Basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How do we get to this? Um, we were talking cars... I think I was talking about that ratchet effect where, you know, one important thing is that there are products which actually oh. change your whole... Yes. Your whole outlook. So um, once experienced... Actually, your entire kind of preferences and utility function gets reset. Yep. Because the experience effectively rejigs in your mind what's important. Yeah. 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 And we were also talking about kind of advertising and marketing being seen as bad. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you said that. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I've spent most of my, you know, I, I don't really, I'm, I'm very, very proud of the work on vaping, by the way. I mean, that was probably the most, you know, most valuable thing I did in my life was going mm. to the government's behavioural insights team and saying there are these things coming along called electronic cigarettes, one. Mm. Because they mimic the habit and experience of smoking, they're probably a major gateway off cigarettes. Mm. Okay, two. Three, and this was actually the more important psychological insight, my hunch is that almost everybody in the health, in what you might call the, the health industry, mm. is going to try and ban them. Okay, yeah. Okay. What I would say is go to the government. They did this. David Halpin went to what was then the Cameron government and said, we think these electronic cigarettes are going to be useful rather than, you know, or at least it's harm reduction whose benefits outweigh the costs. Let's yep. put it like that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's not perfect. Perfect is everybody going cold turkey. I get that. But the perfect is often the enemy of the good. Yeah. And actually... The UK and Sweden, which have the lightest touch regulation 
on alternatives. In Sweden, of course, it's the pouches, the nicotine pouches they put in there, which, to be honest, give me the shits, but, I mean, they're, they're pretty potent. Uh, but but and in, in the UK, it tends to be a very liberal approach to e-cigarettes and vaping. Yeah. And those two countries seem to have the lowest rate of smoking in Europe. So, you know, there is, you know, not, okay, correlation mm. is not at all that, but... Um, that was the one thing where, you know, of all the things I did in my life, which was probably valuable, I think it was that. Sure. How, how, how do you feel about the sort of, you've talked, I think, in, in alchemy and in some other things around psychological value. Hmm. Um, and it almost strikes me that psychological value, the fact that we're calling it psychological, <laughs> almost makes it distinct from actual value. Um, what's your what's well, your take yeah, on it's, it's completely wrong because if you're if you're an Austrian school economist, value is all psychological. The only definition of value they accept is your willingness to pay f- for something. And they also argue that um, interestingly, this is why Austrian school economics never got mathematical because just for, as a detail, they also argue that um, actually preference is ordinal, not cardinal. Okay, uh, what does that mean? Well, okay, so. They would they would look at a choice in the Austrian school and say, you prefer an iPhone over an Android phone. Sure. Okay. Um they would now economics, in order to have this idea of utility, has to have the idea that you actually value the uh, the, the iPhone at 1.374 times more highly than the equivalently priced other phone. Okay. Okay. Fine. Now, Austrian school economics, or at least Ludwig von Mises says, it's a nonsense, you either prefer it or you don't. That's what determines your behavior. It's a nonsense to actually suggest that we're going around optimizing all the time yep. uh, for um, uh, you know our utility function. Sure. Like the sorts of people that would spend 18 hours researching a phone might care about the Snapdragon processor, but most people don't. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 I mean, that, that, those are inter- that, that's an interesting question, which is the misalignment often between the metrics which phone developers or technologists pursue, yeah. which tend to be SI-derived units like speed, time, process of power. Yeah. What is it? Flops or something, is but, it? Yeah, teraflops okay. or whatever. Okay, teraflops yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Okay, right. And the actual consumer experience, what the consumer wants. Yeah. I'm sorry to bore people who've heard me before, but I always cite the Uber map as a work of psychological genius, which is that, yes, we prefer taxis to turn up earlier rather than later. I buy that. But within a reasonable margin of error, like the difference between five minutes or 10 minutes or the difference between seven minutes and 12 minutes, what we actually care about much more than punctuality is actually uncertainty. And what the map does is it doesn't necessarily re- well, it doesn't reduce the quantity of wait time. Yeah. It transforms the quality of wait time because we're no longer in a state of not knowing, a state of panic, a state of what if he's already left? Oh, I bet they were lying. They always lie. Oh, they probably haven't sent a taxi at all. And it replaces it with, oh, look, there he is. I guess he'll be here in another three minutes. I'll have another pint. That's probably half, <laughs> another half. Okay. And so, you know, it, it, uh, and so that's a beautiful, beautiful case of literally conjuring up emotional value out of nowhere. Mm. Now, you could do a predictive algorithm which routes cars to where you anticipate high demand and da da da. But there are downsides to that. It's expensive to do, it requires a large amount of scale yep. to do it. And also, what I suspect would happen if you did that is every time you got it wrong and you sent a driver to a place where there was no demand they'd get really pissed off. Yep. You know, your algorithm would say, oh, there's a fantastic nightclub there and there's always a lot of demand at 2 o'clock in the morning, right? But, you know, they're closed for repairs, mm. right? And so suddenly 17 taxis are sent to some weird alley in Shoreditch yep. at 2 o'clock in the morning and there's nobody there, yep. okay? They're not going to be happy. The map's perfect because actually the one thing they don't have is people ringing them up going, where the hell are you? Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, when you order from Domino's. You get, I don't know if yeah. you've seen, you get that thing where it's like your pizza's in the oven when we're now doing the thing. And it probably bears no resemblance to reality. But well, I've, this, heard, I've, heard con- yeah. <laughs> I've heard contrary views about that. Oh, Some yeah. people say that actually, no, the Domino's thing is quite honest. Right. Other people have said that actually it's kind of... Um, there, are, there are things which hack it. A lot of door close buttons on elevators. Um, and I think a lot of buttons on Pelican Crossings are actually yeah. kind of... Um, placebo buttons. Yep. They're there to give you something to do if you're impatient for the, the elevator to leave. Yep. But they're not actually connected mm. to anything at all. Yeah, I find that when I order from Deliveroo or Uber Eats, the fact that like, oh, your rider has arrived at the restaurant. Oh, your rider's waiting. It's just sort of those those extra touch points make me look forward and anticipate. <laughs> like, yeah, 
Food's on the way. I don't need to worry. I, I, yeah. I want to confess this. Yeah. Now, there's a wonderful model by David Rock, a neuroscientist, called the SCARF model. It stands okay. for status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness. Call it reciprocality. It's probably better. And fairness. Okay. Okay. And there are five things, okay, which matter hugely to humans on an emotional level, but which economics doesn't understand and which we can't really quantify. Hmm. And I always joke that the Uber map also has a small status dimension, which is that I like to time my departure from the building onto the sidewalk to <laughs> coincide exactly, particularly if it's Uber Lux, by yeah. the way, to coincide exactly with the car drawing up because it makes me feel like Kaiser Soze <laughs> at the end of The Usual Suspects. You know, yep. It makes you feel like Louis XIV. You know, it makes you feel... You know, walking out of a building and having a car draw up feels really cool. Standing in the rain going, I wonder which of these is my car or maybe none of them. Mm. You, know, you wouldn't get Snoop doing that, would you? No. You know, <laughs> Right? And so there are other details, and I think there's a little bit of a fillet when you just get out of the car without having to do any transactions. Yeah. Thanks very much. Feels like a chauffeur rather than a taxi. Yeah. Um, changing gears a little bit. Uh, one thing that I heard you briefly mention in one of your talks is kind of the psychology of happiness. Mm. And it strikes me that you come across, at least, as a very kind of happy, <laughs> cheery kind of guy. Not always. Uh, but at least, in the, I guess, in the public mm. uh the, the 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 public perception. Um, what are your thoughts on, I guess, how the lessons from the world of advertising and marketing can be applied to something like happiness? I think, by the way, when you first start seeing the world as a complex system rather than a kind of deterministic, mechanistic thing, I think it makes you happier in the long term but sad in the short term. Okay. Because, you know, I was cast into a kind of depression when I first read things like The Selfish Gene. Yeah. Come on, shit, this is actually plausible. It really is just that fucking random, okay? Um, you know, uh, you know, there is no particular narrative arc that's mm. actually, you know, or, or to, as someone said, you know, a very, very profound but seemingly banal statement about evolutionary biology, which is things are the way they are because they got that way. Yep. And there isn't necessarily a plan. And actually, the need to see everything... Um, as purposeful, okay, probably messes up economics, actually, you know, because a very large part of economics is probably driven by luck, happenstance, serendipity, fluke. I'll, I'll, give, you, well, I'll give you an example, penicillin, okay, the whole of medicine will probably be different um, uh, if, uh, uh, by the way, <laughs> if you're the real worry, um, <laughs> On the day the discovery of penicillin was made, um, uh, Fleming was kind of working from home. Uh, he had a cottage somewhere in Suffolk mm. and wasn't supposed to come into London that day, but happened to go into London and noticed that all the bacteria surrounding this patch of random mould that had blown through the window had actually died. Mm. My guess would have been that he did briefly consider just chucking it in the bin and starting again. Now, OK, you're saying, oh, well, we would have discovered penicillin anyway. Possibly, but there was work at the time on a thing called, I think, salt super sulfides or something, which were an alternative kind of antibacterial agent. Without penicillin, you know, you would have possibly made enough progress with those super sulfides, okay, to stop looking elsewhere. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, an awful lot of this shit really is that goddamn random. I mean, God, you know, I mean, you know, Mick and Keith meeting on a train, and what was it? I think Mick happened to have a load of blues records, which mm. got key the other way around, got one of them talking to the other, okay? You know, I mean, the great bands, you know, what is it? I mean, Roxy Music and Brian Eno, I think it was a tubes platform, wasn't it? Was it? Okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah. what, what, what the hell were the Beatles yeah. doing going to the same school? Yeah. You know, all that stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, a huge amount of this stuff is spectacularly random mm. and very, very path-dependent. You know, I mean... One of the most interesting things reading that book by Noah Harari, you know, is the view, which I'm not sure about, but that actually the invention of agriculture was kind of a disaster mm, yeah. because it forced everybody either either get overrun by your agricultural neighbours who can basically outpopulate you by a factor of about 20 or give up, a, you know, or effectively get with the agriculture program yep. and engage in suddenly hierarchical societies, yep. you know, all manner of kind of oppression and um, control. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, 
Yeah, I kind of, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, you know, it's that fantastic thing, isn't it? That, you know, it was an arbitrary thing in the initial evolution of the eye, yep. whether it was convex or concave, yep. okay? And insects like flies have a convex um, shape to the eye to give it some sort of resolution and directional imaging. Mm. And it so happened that, you know, our ancestors had a concave shape. The concave shape can evolve into a lens, okay? The convex shape never can. So yeah, I mean, you know, when you when you realise that, it is kind of depressing because you realise there isn't a kind of, you know, wig theory of history where yeah. everything gets better and better and better, and actually there's a whole load of random shit going on. Of, you know, I, I was amazed, by the way, at the. I mean, I voted Remain, but the confidence of Remainers in pronouncing it a bad decision hmm. struck me as. I mean, you really know enough about the future to, to <laughs> confidently pronounce this a bad decision. Yeah. You know, I mean, you also look at it, by the way, I also made the point, okay, let's say you thought the EU was pretty good as it currently stands, mm. okay? But you thought that in the next 20 years, and bear in mind, older people are slightly more conscious of the direction of travel of the EU, okay? Yeah. Because they've been around for longer. They've got more chronological context. Let's say you thought there was a 20% chance that um, uh, the EU would morph into something highly unattractive or inescapable or whatever, you know, or just, you know, uh, and actually, or just a kind of bureaucratic, you know, nightmare, because you don't have enough cohesion between the 27 countries for them ever to get rid of the governmental class simultaneously. Yeah. Okay. In the UK, every 10, 15, 20 years, there's kind of political earthquake, same in the US, okay, and the entire government class gets replaced. Yeah. Run out of ideas, become corrupt, whatever it may be. Now, that's impossible in the EU, particularly with 27 countries. And, and so, you know, there's the possibility. By the way, the idea that groups of people make better decisions is, is very, very unsafe. Okay. okay. There are all sorts of things like the Abilene effect, where you can get collective insanity, where all 27 people go along with something they don't really agree with for fear of looking like a party pooper, yep. for example. That, that's called the Abilene effect. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Hmm. So if you thought, okay, I just think the EU is a bit dangerous because everybody in the governmental class is far too committed to this idea of, you know, gains to scale. Yep. They're far too committed, often for status reasons, to the idea of general cosmopolitanism and, and you know, and the eradication of national boundaries and differences. Then you have to ask a problem. Okay, I think there's a 20% risk. This wouldn't bother me normally, but when ever again will we get a chance to leave? Yeah. And the likelihood would have been this was your if you believe that the EU is risky and might head off somewhere dangerous, you had to ask. As a, you know, if you're looking at this decision objectively, mm. um, I don't really want to leave now, but I know that it's only a matter of time before you get a Europhile government which wants to join the Euro. Then you know, then you can never leave. Then da 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 da. Um, I don't really want to leave now, but I have to leave now because I have no idea of the direction of travel of this vehicle. Yep. But all I know is this is the last. This is the last station at which I can get off. Yeah. Okay. Now. To make that decision is not irrational, okay? It's absolutely nonsensical to say that's irrational. Mm. You may disagree with it. And by the way, I'm, to I'm totally happy listening to both sides of opinion who acknowledge, you know, that it, you know, there is a trade-off involved. Yeah. But this idea that you were mad, racist, and horrible, and there was no other possible reason why you do this, yeah. those people, I mean, have you genuinely thought, you know, have these people genuinely... Are they incapable of thinking in things in more than one way? In mm. other words, are they so infected by the kind of Davos groupthink mm. that they genuinely can envisage no other alternative future? Because if that's yeah. the case, then I, w I want these people gone, you know. <laughs> I think that's a great place to wrap this up. Mm. Um, final thing I'd love to ask, any book recommendations? Lots. <laughs> mm. We've talked about a few already um, throughout this conversation, but... Yeah, I've just. What's what are some books uh, that you find yourself? Richard Shotton is pretty good. Okay, um, uh, he's written lots of books about behavioural science. If you want to become a rapid practitioner, Richard Shotton is the first place. Okay. Obviously, Cialdini, Kahneman, Thaler, etc. The what you might call the canon of behavioural science. Yep. Um, uh, also, Dan Ariely. Yep. Um, a lot of these people hate each other, uh, but that's because they're academics and they're weird. Okay, um, you know the whole thing's whack. Um, uh, the um, uh, um, uh, great book I read recently. Um, I mean, algorithms to live by. Um, seeing like a state, which, by the way, I think is 
also a warning not only to government that their weird averagey way of making the populace comprehensible yeah. actually destroys understanding in the process. Okay. Uh, I think it has enormous implications for large dot com entities, hmm. which is that what happens when the person who has the problem, the customer who has the problem, fundamentally cannot get in touch with anybody who has the power to solve it. Hmm. Okay? Yeah. Which you could argue is a little bit of an argument for Brexit, but it's certainly an argument for localism. Yeah. Okay. Which is actually let's keep the, you know let let's maintain this principle of kind of subsidiarity, mm. where decision making is devolved as low down the organisation as is possible and as close to the consumer as possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's seeing like a state by James C. Scott. Um, I'm gonna. This is gonna be a slight cross section of interesting books. What I'm currently listening to is Drayton Bird's book, You Did What, which is his life in direct marketing, which is fantastic. He's now in his 80s. But he was, when I joined Ogilvy and May, the direct, one of the decisive people in my life, other than my parents, a guy I knew at university who was a mature student called Ray Falk, who was studying architecture at Christ's in the 80s, but had previously been the, um, uh, he, he and his brothers had organized the Isle of Wight festivals in the, uh, what, 60. 68, 69, 70. Uh -huh. So when he was in his early 20s, he was kind of negotiating with Dylan and, um, uh, you know, the Doors and everybody else. That, that utterly fascinating guy, entrepreneur, huge influence. But Drayton Bird was the third great influence, I suppose, along with a few of the other people who are, if you like, acolytes of Drayton Bird. Okay. Um, but uh, he was an extraordinary man who was the chairman of Ogilvy and May the Direct when I first joined yeah. and was utterly, you know, really fantastic influence. And so I'm just reading his um, memoirs at the moment. Um, I mentioned Algorithms to Live By and The Alignment Problem. Uh, I that Those are two interesting books I've read recently. There's a great book called Unreasonable Hospitality, which has just come out, which is a, a restaurateur from New York yep. uh, with a very interesting philosophy on hospitality and or service. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan, by the way, of, of effectively... As I said, the recurring fractal patterns model of how life works. Reading about a completely unrelated business yeah. uh, and saying what is, you know, well, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of this, okay? Airlines have spotted the fact with loyalty programs that if you're a frequent flyer, uh, your um, utility function, if you like, your preferences are different to infrequent flyers. Okay? If you're an infrequent flyer, you fly once a year, actually queuing for eight minutes to check in isn't yeah. that much of a burden. If you fly every week, it drives you insane, okay? And so they spot frequent flyers and they treat them differently. No railway's done this, hmm. when you think about it, okay? Now, what if you actually made a third of the carriages on a typical train, or 40%, first class, and the people who could use the first class passenger carriages were people who bought a first class ticket, one, people who had a season ticket, who have more right to a seat than an occasional traveller, yep. okay, because having to stand once every three months is a bit of a bummer, but it's no big deal. Having to stand every day for three months is intolerable. You mm. feel totally, you know, robbed, mm. really, okay? Uh, anybody with an old person's rail card, uh, and anybody who's a frequent traveller just gets a slightly better class of seat, mm. okay? Now, th the airlines have been doing that. Okay, so even if you're flying in economy, if you're a frequent flyer, you get the business class experience at check-in, uh, you get the business class experience at boarding, you know, the, the airport and uh, the lounge. The airport experience is business class. It's only in the plane you're in economy, mm. okay? That's that's what they've done for ages with airlines. Now, Nobody now they're not exactly wildly different industries, right? They're both in transportation, but nobody has asked the question. Well, what if we could take that and transplant it? Mm. I think there are probably you know I don't know ten percent of businesses out there that could steal the idea of Amazon Prime, for example. Yeah, I recently signed up to the Pret Coffee subscription. Ah, it's that, so good. So and tell me how it works. How much a month is it? So it's twelve pound fifty for the first month, twenty five pounds a month thereafter, and you get up to five free coffees every day. Um, with and, like, and can that be obviously for your friends? Because five for yourself might be a bit excessive, is it? Uh, it can also be for your friends, but you, it, there's got to be at least thirty minutes between each order. Got it. Yeah. yeah. And so what that means practically? Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. So yeah. you can't get five all in one go. 
You, could you get two in a go? No, just one. No, just the one. Just one. Just but one. you can go 500 a day if you really want to. So now p- part of my routine is, well, there's like loads of Pretts nearby. Instead of making a coffee at home, I'll just walk to the nearest Pret. I get some fresh air. I go to Pret. And usually while I'm there, ask the team, hey, anyone want anything? I end up buying a bit more. Maybe I'll get a box of fruit. Well, and I, now yeah. I, I do not go to any coffee shop other than Pret, purely because they've got the Amazon Prime model. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I've always wondered why no hotel chain has done it, where I live in Seven Oaks or just outside, um, and uh, you know, basically a taxi home from London to Seven Oaks is about 120. It used to be famously seven pounds an oak to Seven Oaks. That's what the black cab yeah. drivers would always quote. But it's now more like 120, yeah. uh, maybe a bit more actually. And I mean Uber would be a bit less. Um, uh, but um, uh, the interesting thing to me was. Why isn't there a deal where I can pay like Marriott or Intercontinental Hotel Group and I go, look, here's the deal. I pay you 100 quid a year, hmm. okay? After 10 p.m., I, I've missed my train, okay? I can check into any hotel where you have a vacancy and pay 50% of the thing, okay? Now, you know, um, uh, interestingly, um, I was talking to someone who worked front of front desk at one of the most expensive hotels in London, who said, funnily enough, we always used to give the upgrades to the business travellers mm. because two things, they only stayed for one night. So you're only giving away the upgrade for that night. But also they didn't hang around all day demanding ancillary butler services. Yeah. So they're actually comparatively cheap to serve, you see. Yeah. Now, that arrangement would seem to me obviously sensible because, you know, what's the worst that will going to happen? Well, okay, you've got the, I suppose you've got the, okay, you have to, change the bedding and stuff, but that's probably 20 quid, 30 quid, room turnover cost at the max, okay? Now, that would strike me as an obvious kind of symbiotic relationship between hotel chains and people who live in, you know, Tunbridge Wells. Mm. You know, people who live... And particularly, you know, if people are moving out to... uh, If you think about it with flexible working, if people are moving out to York, well, there's no way you can get a taxi home to York. That would be a pretty damn good deal, wouldn't it? Okay, you've got your, you know, your crash pad. And yet nobody's done it. Costco's done it. Amazon's done it. Ocado's done it. Okay. It seems weird to me that, you know, too few people have done it. Why don't you... Now, actually, Tesco's now doing it with Club Card, I think, aren't they? Where you pay a bit extra, but you get either discounts or perks on top. Yeah. Yeah, like the Waitrose card. I mean, the only reason I got that was because you get like 30% off the fresh produce or fresh ah, got it. thingy yeah. and it was like it immediately pays for itself <laughs> of course of course or like the train rail card or anything like that but right? again yeah. it's back to that psychology of you know friends and family that i mentioned at the very beginning of the talk as yeah. well you can make the same discount seem very very different yeah. even if it's identical economically yeah. you can make it very very different emotionally and that's that's all that's all i'm saying really is that the the economics uh, that economic well-being does not translate into emotional well-being very well, mm. especially if we insist on using um, numerical metrics, okay, yeah. in order to construct some model, okay? Okay, the what you gain is an artificial kind of certainty, and what you lose is the fact that in many cases the model barely has any resemblance to what's really going on in real life. Nice. Rory, I think that's a fantastic place to end this. Thank you so Absolute much. Absolute pleasure. Uh, where can people learn more about you? Uh, we'll obviously put links uh, to everything Twitter down below. My Twitter feeds at Rory Sutherland, uh, all one word. Um, uh, uh, the books are... Um, now, I'm going to actually say a thank you to Amazon, because although the book sold about 70,000, uh, WH Smiths have never stocked it, even as a Penguin paperback. Mm. And so loads of people go, oh, dear, dear, Amazon are killing the bookshops. Well, yes, but equally, bookshops weren't doing any favours to anybody other than the most mainstream authors. So, you know, I'm always very, very keen, by the way, in taking an opposite side of what you might call the middle-class default position. (laughs) Because middle-class people are basically sheep, okay? It's, you know, in other words, they're so status-conscious that actually uh, they say things for what they imply, not for not for actual validity, yep. okay? And one of the things I often do is defend chains. So I'll launch into a passionate defense of things like Holiday Inn Express, Premier Inn, and Travel Lodge. Let me explain why, okay? Those things did a fantastic favor to the UK hotel industry by setting a floor, okay? Yep. They're basically pretty good or better. 
If you want to open a hotel, you've got to be at least that good or you go out of business. Therefore, I can confidently book a hotel, whether it's a travel lodge or a non-travel lodge, and know it's going to be at least about as good as a travel lodge. Okay. Yep. Now, in the age before you had chains like that, the same goes for coffee. Okay. Uh, every time you bought a coffee, every time you um, you checked into a hotel, you're basically, you know, it, it was a massive gamble with a fairly high chance that it was absolute shite. And so it's worth noting, okay, that actually there's a value, a huge value, not just to raising the ceiling, there's a huge value to raising the floor. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you know, I know, and there was a great guy who was an independent coffee shop owner who said, I'm not going to diss Starbucks. He said, it was those guys who made it possible for me to charge three pounds for a coffee in the yeah. first place. You know, he said, if it weren't for Starbucks, I wouldn't have a bigger business. I wouldn't have a business at all. Yeah fair way of looking at it absolutely right Rory thank you so much absolute pleasure all right so that's it for this week's episode of deep dive thank you so much for watching or listening all the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes depending on where you're watching or listening to this if you're listening to this on a podcast platform then do please leave us a review on the itunes store it really helps other people discover the podcast or if you're watching this in full hd or 4k on youtube then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode that would be awesome and if you enjoyed this episode you might like to check out this episode here as well which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.